heavy metal resistance, selection of crops with improved genetic makeup, nutritional requirements of both annual and perennial systems, application technology and development of environmentally sound fertilizer use, molecular and genetic aspects of nutrient acquisition and tolerance. And he has handled many projects and current projects are on plant microbe interaction, that is to understand the speciation mechanism under heavy metal uh, reach conditions and secondary cell wall dynamics in coniferous tree and other angiosperm trees mm -hmm. and plant tissue culture. And he has also carried out many projects funded by DBT and DRDO and uh, Demastered Vietnam. And uh, he has industrial experience and uh, he worked as research consultant, Phytoscience USA, and he is a functional head and advisor, Disha Life Science Private Limited. And uh, he has, uh, uh, to his credentials of research and academic uh, experience, where he has uh, been served as member building committee Central University of Jharkhand, member of technical advisory board Nimala Women's College, and member of recruitment screening cell and IKC, and external member of BOS Jharkhand, and chairperson BOS Jharkhand, and member of academic council Central University of Jharkhand, and is a reviewer of several review journals, including Springer, Taylor, Francis, and elsewhere. And coming to his uh, research guidance, he has uh, guided more than five PhD candidates and two MPhil candidates and 10 of MTech and 20 of PTech. And he has been conferred with many awards and uh, recognition and fellowship. Few of the important ones are, he was a panelist in Durdarshan Jar during the year 2020 and vice chancellor's recognition for extraordinary contribution as DSW in Central University of Jargon during 2020 and Best Teaching Award Academic Council, Amity University of Uttar Pradesh during July 2015, and National Research Foundation Forestry and Agro Biotechnology Institute, University of Terria during 2008, and International Research Fellowship by Mondi and Sapi, and Paper and Pulp Industry, University of Pretoria, and uh, DBT PDF Department of Biotechnology Research Development, Ministry of Sciences and Technology, by IISC, that is Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore during 2005, and is also a recipient of JRF and SRF at School of Life Sciences, JNTU, sorry, JNU, New Delhi. And he has published many papers, around uh, more than 60 papers in reputed international and national journals. And uh, he has also written many book chapters and edited books. And uh, through this, we understand that he's an eminent person short introduction, I invite Dr. Manoj Kumar to deliver his uh, talk. And the title of his talk is Rhizospheric Microorganisms Associated with Plant Systems Growing Under Extreme Climatic Conditions. And it's questionable, is it exploitable? And thank you. And I welcome you, sir. And I thank Dr. Alim Khan, sir, to, uh, who have given me this opportunity to introduce the first speaker of today's technical session. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Manoj, sir. Thank you so much, Aruna, ma'am. And uh, my sincere gratitude to the organizer, specifically Dr. Khan, for such a vibrant virtual platform provided to us. And the uh, theme of this uh, conference is really remarkable. And uh, I extend my hearty greetings to all and all. And uh, let me share my talk, which is very much concise. And uh, I did try my level best to consolidate so that uh, a message must be given in a very uh, summarized manner. Yeah, it is uh, visible to all. Yes, sir, it is visible, sir. It is visible. Let yes, me yes, 
let me settle down yeah so the topic of uh, my talk is rhizospheric microorganisms associated with plant system growing under extreme climatic condition is it exploitable of course this topic is uh, i have chosen a very uh, you can say open ended topic everybody is connected to this type of the research and entire uh, world is uh, is struggling for the sustainable option uh, through the invisible you know medium that is microorganisms so there are very much benevolence and uh, people are trying to connect to this particular world and uh, having uh, technological milestones in recent uh, last 50 years but uh, it is a very historic you know uh, progress in the micro biological uh, chapter people are finding out novel rhizospheric microorganisms and uh, trying to connect the existence of uh, its uh, uh, you know habitat in a different different forms which is very much depicted in the bottom of the slide you can say everywhere this particular uh, this particular uh, you know population is everywhere in the different different forms and uh, somehow uh, we are uh, you can say uh, overwhelmed with the mutual understanding uh, whether you can say it is a symbiotic uh, interaction or uh, parasitic interaction or some spiritual interaction whatsoever you can call so i again uh, extend my greetings to all and uh, hope you will uh, grab this particular you know discussion in a very uh, concise and specific manner because uh, our team is working on a particular theme and uh, it is not uh, possible to you know give you the entire gist of the this particular infinite world that is rhizospheric microorganisms so okay, so please yeah this is a well known uh, concept i have tried my level best to give you the uh, glimpse of this particular interaction wherein uh, signaling molecule you know is a very uh signaling molecule is very well known characterized by the different different research groups and uh, wherein uh, rhizo microbiome shaping recruitment of beneficiaries or you can see the beneficial symbiosis mutis mutualism recognition and uh, activation of desirable microbe traits so it is very much a specific interaction uh, as far as plant microorganism signaling is concerned uh, of course recognition sites Uh, through the priming and induction of systemic defenses immune suppression effects on plant gene expression hormonal balance development metabolism and stress response so these are the you can say specific uh, you can say objectives those are being you know taken up by the contemporary research research world wherein you can say uh, as i have mentioned sir excuse me yeah sir your uh, size of the found is very small can you i uh, mean say uh, enlarge it Uh, just let me try let me try i'm sorry uh i think it can't be bigger rather you please enjoy the uh, you know uh, screen in that micro but uh, uh, i can't help it out sorry okay sir okay can be anyway uh, i think this particular is taken up from the website so that's why it's microscopic little but in the future in the uh, further slides you can i think so uh, see the entire uh, content anyway uh, it's not a very uh, very important and uh, it is hardcore it is very kind of example so how intra and interspecies species signaling among microorganisms you know occur that's i try to uh, the plant root soil interfaces uh, that uh, could be considered the rhizosphere area which is the most important active zone in the soil you can say of the different different microbial activities 
for example, how these particular roots are being triggered for the biodegradation of pollutants and plant nutrition. That is that is very much uh, from the stress side. The polluted soil are characterized by the low organic matter content, limiting their microbial activities, nutrient availability, and degradation of pollutants. So the uh, message of this particular so uh, slide is the soil phyto or bioremediation uh, part or at the end uh, how uh, the beneficiaries or you can say the products are being you know uh, delegated that is the kind of the message from this particular yeah so again uh, we all know the plant microbe interactions of course so you, if you take the example of standing plant then you can say you can demarcate the different different zone phylosphere zone endosphere zone rhizosphere zone so rhizosphere zone rhizosphere zone is very much uh, targeted and uh, these are very much vibrant also because you must be knowing the existence of the particular microorganisms are uh, you know uh, you know, drawing the equations at the geospatial level, how ionic conversion occurs, and ultimately how they define the, you know, bio availability of a certain uh, content, whether it is zinc, iron, copper. So it depends upon the concentration value or intake value of a particular plant, how it absorbs and absorbs, and ultimately it is uh, how it, you know, it is involved in the triggering a certain metabolic pathway. Ultimately, uh, Again, uh, beneficial microbes are being characterized, commercial microbes and the pathogenic microbes based on the you know, intake value of certain, uh, you can say, uh, uh, certain flora and the for, uh, you know, then uh, equations are being drawn between the flora and fauna as per their given conditions. So, uh, of course, the people, those are working on the PGPRs, understanding this particular you know, example in a well. So, promote plant growth, increase productivity, induce systemic resistance, nutrient requisitions, enhance soil fertility, induce phytoremediation ecosystem functioning. Those are the ultimate product of the beneficial microbes. Commercial microbes, indirect effect on the plant and pathogens, then induced these conditions and other other things. As far as technological, you know, microbiology is concerned and development and applications, of course, we are being much dependent on the technology and somehow the fundamental scientists are not dependent. Moreover, fundamental scientists are not dependent on the technological, you know, advancement, though they give the sufficient clue to, uh, you know, uh, trigger or to establish certain the technological, you know, milestones as far as uh, you can say a decade story is concerned uh, moderation you know uh, is being predicted for the use of microorganisms in the production of foods and beverages specifically in the agricultural sectors however the uh, you can say uh, beneficial microorganisms such as plant growth promoters and phytopathogen controllers are required of various agricultural crops and many species are being used as bioreactors for or biofactories of important pharmacological molecules. The use of biofactories, you know, just like microorganisms have been explored for the synthesis of diverse chemicals, uh, so and so. So based on such discussions, you can say being, you know, classified as like agricultural technological microbiology chemical and field technological microbiology, environment technical microbiology, medical technology microbiology, materials technological microbiology. So it's an infinite journey, but uh, our research, you know, uh, discussion is very much confined on this particular, uh, you know, uh, explanation. This is a, we, uh, our research team is focused on the uh, particular metagenomics and next generation sequencing, the study of microbial communication to optimum genetic data. Our research scholars are focusing on this particular theme and, uh, uh, this is a basic theme and ultimately is, uh, we are exploiting the metagenomic approaches and uh, using the next generation sequencing approaches and uh, one by one we, we characterizing the kind of uh, novel strengths and uh, so and so. Of course, uh, uh, this is a kind of, uh, you can say, uh, uh, very, it's a very, not a very old, uh, uh, you know, research outcome. As far as root architecture is concerned, you can see the different different grass roots have been taken for the emphasis and uh, diversity of the root system architecture. Okay, how it occurs in the different different climatic conditions, and then how it is being, you know, uh, uh, 
understood at the different different level that is much needed because and where the involvement of the rhizospheric uh, microbes so these are the kind of mutualism and uh, ultimately this picture is trying to uh, explain the concept between the interaction of the rhizospheric microorganisms and the roots whether roots uh, or the root growth is depending upon the existence of the certain population at the rhizospheric level or somehow it is uh, growing in the different different uh, climatic conditions where biotic and abiotic stresses are also you know understood in a very confined manner our research one of the paper we have published in the um, uh, physiology and microbiology is and uh, this is sketch is showing you know, the kind of root architecture of certain medicinal plant is hippophyrum nodis uh, this is the medicinal plants and uh, this plant is uh, found in the leh ladakh region the drdu sponsored project we have taken up and this uh, hippophyrum nodis you know uh, having enormous range of medicinal and nutrient benefits the significant abilities of this plant to survive in himalayan high altitude in uh, in our study to investigate the rhizosphere and then the several strains we have isolated and the rhizospheric soil and plant root nodules particularly in the specific target and uh, uh, at the end we found certain economically important strains like frankia uh, azori jojimium bacillus uh, uh, then uh, uh certain other pseudomonas you know strains and uh, still we are characterizing at the molecular level and using the metagenomic tool and understanding the fate of its interaction how these particular strains are giving the support to this particular plant uh, to grow under stress condition uh, specifically under hypoxia condition where the atmospheric pressure is very high and oxygen level is very low though it is surviving there and uh, we found specific things and then the uh mm, of course i would like to uh, give you the salient uh, you know aspect of this particular picture okay, how, what we have done exactly so uh this root sketch which is being shown over here the horizontal roots and broad networking which ranged from 2 to 5 mm in the, in the uh, diameter uh, uh, diameters the vertical root range from 10 to 50 cm in length the diameter of the main root varied from 1.9 to 2.4 cm at the junction and 0.1 to 9 to 0.0033 cm at the tapered end the feeding root system of hippophyrum nodis uh, reached up to 30 to 40 cm depth and made extensive branch branching to form complex networking newly spurred planted are found to be originating directly from certain zones of the main horizontal root so this is the kind of the networking system ke how it grows and how it protects the soil also uh, from the soil erosion so then the main plant and the distinct type of nodules the main plant and the plantlets we are in 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 uh, inter interconnected to form the network to distinct type of nodules were observed on the roots of hippophyrum nodules so this is the novel features of this particular plant with the help of the rhizospheric microbes which i have named earlier which were either brown or which is in color uh, remnoids so which were either brown or which is in color uh, is the it was very much confusing somehow we captured the picture with the sophisticated facilities uh, at the drdo uh, center of here in the bihar leh ladakh the brown nodules were distributed randomly on certain root branches while white nodules were arranged sequentially in the certain other branches of roots the branches with white nodules which did not have brown nodules and vice versa the other characteristic of this extensive and prominently horizontal root system of hippophy root like suit buds root hair white colored nodules so just i'm trying to figure out ke how this uh, novel architecture is possible under such a stressed condition is uh, being possible only with the involvement of the frankia and frankia is the leading strain which is found exponentially you know in due course of the growth and development of the plant so this is the kind of various structure like different colored root nodules and root hairs Uh, drew our attention and uh, you know uh, unveil the inner content of this atas structure of course enzymatic characterization is also being done and then we found through the sectioning of the root and the brown nodules and the white nodules which were stained and uh, uh, got expressed 
with a different different sectioning of the three and the normal root brown nodules were white nodules and diverse arrangements of the epidermal, endodermal and steel cells. The cortex cells of root with brown nodules retained the di-lactophenol blue and the epidermal cells of the root white. So you can say uh, these various root modifications uh, observed in hypophy, uh, uh, brown nodules and the white nodules and the root hair. These three uh, sections we have taken and understood biochemically also the existence of these strains which I have named earlier are very much uh, you know uh, surrogated in the different different layers of the roots and the shoots. So we have identified the rhizobacteria, then did the qualitative analysis of the enzymes to their found specifically pectinase in the cellulase, to their secondary cell wall enzymes and then the of course, in the uh, uh, correspondingly, we uh, found that these rhizobacteria, you know, correspond to this pectinase and the cellulose enzymes and root degrading enzymes are uh, ultimately uh, detected as a root degrading enzymes. So we did the enzymatic assay and found fundamentally uh, very much um, present over there. And then uh, we did the cladogram on the isolated stains. These stains are uh, representing the relativeness of the certain uh, uh, bacillus species uh, with the bacillus species and the azurizinum uh, species of Frankia. Uh, and still we are characterizing the and uh, creating the mutants of the Frankia and understanding how it is uh, important at the secondary, uh, you know, activities level. So, uh, at the end, you can say Frankia stains are very much uh, predominant. And then along with this Frankia bacillus is also very much uh, pre uh, predominant in this particular uh, sector. So the plant uh, remnoides, hippophy remnoides, uh, which exhibits an emerging root structure for infesting symbiotic bacteria in anatomically variant nodules and maximum collection of water and nutrients through root branches and root hairs and presence of these diverging microbial groups in the root and different root uh, monodes directed as the possibility for the production of the plant root degrading enzymes by the associated rhizobacteria. And then the certain number of the rhizobacteria were isolated from the rhizospheric soils and root nodules of the plant. And uh, of course, um, uh, these particular strains are reported as PGPR, uh, which help the plant with activities like nitrogen fixation, phosphate cellulization and other uh, important gaseous productions and the cedar for formation and uh, just like other fundamental parameters these are meeting. So the samples from three different different sites we have collected and uh, did the uh, biochemical analysis and then uh, did the ICP AS analysis and we found the soil characteristics are also very varied. Uh, because of the existence of these rhizospheric microbes because they release exudates the certain compounds and and uh, involved in the geospecific me mechanism also ultimately these are the kind of the reportings and uh, uh, still these are very much with us and we have created consortia and uh, you know, students are working on this particular strains a particular st student at the um, tech level msc level and phil level and they are working on this particular strains and uh, uh, and creating the database in a very uh, conceptualized manner so you can see the activities of the different different enzymes uh, corresponding to the different different strains and uh, of course, concentration is very important. And these have the kind of industrial implications at the end, which we are trying our level best to make it very much commercial. So as far as a conclusion of such certain reportings, because I have not uh, connected uh, so many things, you know, at a time, I was very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, though uh, the kind of uh, time limitations because of our university is shifting from one to another campus we are uh, day night working and still i am tired that's why i concluded uh, i concluded uh, my uh, you can say research in a very um, uh, specific manner one of the uh, highlights i have shared with you people and you can say we can dis we can discuss uh, these things uh, in a conclusive manner Roots are many functions for a plant, including anchorage and acquisition of vital nutrients and water necessary for growth. 
blah 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 and then process occurring in the region control a host of reaction regulating terrestrial carbon and other elements rest uh, i will share with you people the rhizobacteria exist into the root nodules and rhizospheric soils future perspective needs uh, reside in the analysis of antimicrobial properties of these enzymes against pathogenic microorganisms then beneficial plant associated microbes can profoundly influence plant health by suppressing disease enhancing nutrient uptake fixing atmospheric nitrogen and promoting plant growth host variation among cultivars and plant genotypes for response to beneficial microorganisms as a suggest that plant genes play a role in supporting these interactions such host variation can be found among diverse group of microorganisms including rhizobia mycorrhizal fungi and microbial biocontrol agents disease variations among plant genotypes for interaction and beneficial microbes has led to a discovery of single genes that is specific compatibility interaction with the, which we are doing currently a continuous variation of interaction phenotypes which is such as disease suppression plant growth nutrition uptake have led to hypothesis and some cases of course these uh, kind of the things we are doing through the knockout mutant analysis in the uh, plant system also and of course clinical trials also being done with the uh, collaboration of the reams uh, you can say we have the uh, medical college in, in the rachi so people are doing on that part also future research into the role of plant genes involved in hosting beneficial plant associated microbes Uh, will provide greater insight into the relatively unexplored area of biology and should provide new tools to improve plant health in agriculture of course answer is yes the and the traits those are uh, you know found in the rhizosphere region is very much exploitable some uh, i would like to acknowledge central head of jharkhand ranchi and uh, dr ahmed abdul halim khan ji Uh, and invited me and i express my sincere gratitude to department of botany telangana university for having such a great you know conference and of course the funding agency drdo and then our team uh, member like pooja sonam and our collaborative dr nashim from icgv dr uh, Joginder Singh is from Lovely Professional University. Dr. Joginder Pal Khasa from Delhi University, and uh, Dr. Himanshu from Ayesar Bhopal. So we are working in a collaborative manner. This is the administrative our future few glimpses our administrative build, building, and this is a uh, uh, you can say very proud moment when our in our convocation, Honorable Vice President of India uh, arrived and blessed the convocation. Thank you so much for giving the opportunity. thank you very much sir for readily accepting our uh, uh, request for uh, invited talk thank you very much uh, and uh, we uh, we expect any doubts are there we will be uh, putting an email to you uh, so much for joining and uh, giving us a very good opportunity to learn so many things about rhizospheric organisms and thank you so much sir thank you so uh, much dr khan Thank Now uh, I request uh, our next speaker. Uh, uh, next speaker from Bangladesh. We have we, he is very very much ready. Uh, Professor Abdullah Muhammad Sohel. Sohel sir, can you switch on your? Uh, let me say, can you share your screen? Okay, you can. Uh, okay, I'll pin it up. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, i'll be briefly re, uh, giving a sketch of uh, abdullah uh, professor abdullah mohammed uh, sohel uh, he is a professor in department of biotechnology and genetic engineering jahangir nagar university sabar dhaka bangladesh about uh, professor sohel uh, dr sohel has joined the international rice research institute as a research collaborator after completing his phd for, uh, on agriculture biotechnology from Changbuk National University, South Korea, in 2006, where he worked on the oversee of equiporin functions of drought tolerant mechanisms in rice. While pursuing his, while pursuing his, uh, um, while pursuing his uh, JSPS uh, postdoctoral fellowship, 2007 to 2009 at uh, Sukuba Sukuba University Japan his uh, prior responsibility as to develop genetically modified lettuce plants harboring a taste to modifying protein maraculin as a research associate at the University of Florida 2009 to 2011 he attained his research goal successfully by developing a model on greening and canker resistant transgenic citrus cultivars 
he was he has a long research track on plant tissue culture commercial production of plant cells through bioreactor food biotechnology microbiology and genetic engineering he has published uh, uh, articles in many international journals and books total citation 830 and h index 15 i10 index 16 uh, research gate score 20.49 his key research he his key research interests to in isolate novel genes from local biodiversity genome engineering and genome editing approach to develop environmentally resilient plants his areas of research interest are metabolomics metabolic engineering secondary metabolism study from various endangered species and their conservation he is also trying to establish institutional biosafety and biosecurity guidelines uh, and uh, procedures he is very keen to arrange campaigns to uh, create public awareness and motivation towards the new technologies he is a life member of microbiological society of india with this few words of introduction i would like to request uh, professor abdullah uh sohail sir to start his presentation over to abdullah sir assalam alaikum uh, am i audible and my slides are visible yes yes your screen is visible as well as your audio is also very clear okay thank you so much good morning uh, i am delighted to be here thank you professor abdul halim for inviting me sas and nice platform to speak in, towards the students of telangana university and myself abdullah mohammad shohail i am right now professor department of the biotechnology and genetic engineering jahangirnagar university shaba and my lab cell genetics and plant biotechnology laboratory in the department first of all um, i would like to uh, give you some intro about my university my university name is jahangirnagar university it was established in 1970 and the university is a public university uh, co educational our honorable president is our chancellor our vice chancellor professor dr farzan islam and we have two pro vice chancellor total uh, about 700 academic staffs and about 15000 students it's located uh, nearby dhaka it's 35 km from uh, center of dhaka and 25 kilometers from the airport international airport uh, though it's a rural area uh, it's con um, total of 700 acres of lands we are having a single campus and largest natural uh, beauties uh, in this campus uh, around the country we have lots of uh, greenery lots lots of lakes and um, little bit highland lowland um, and academic buildings are surrounded in the top of this uh, picture you are seeing this is our wasid mia um, research center this is the largest research center uh, around in the city and then uh, we are the new department i mean though we almost um, 11 years but uh, in terms of university structure we are new and we don't have yet our new building but constructions are going on hopefully we will move uh, soon uh, someone is raising hands do you have any question dr kamal krishna boni hello sir you continue your talk sir actually Okay, 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 and we have uh, lots of lakes. Those lakes uh, during the uh, winter, uh, millions of uh, migratory birds visited here, and so that 
uh, every day so many human visitors also visited to see those migratory birds right now um, as it is it was very short notice so i am not focusing any research data i am highlighting uh, very introductory uh, some um, ideas about the plant bioreactor system and how we could use plant bioreactor system in our um, plant metabolites or secondary metabolites or plant cell culture research so human have been using plants as medicines for a long time under several different principles those are being used as pharmaceuticals flavors fragrances coloring agents food additives and agrochemicals plant cell tissues and organ culture emerged as an alternative over whole plant cultivation plant cells embryos shoots adventitious roots and hairy roots have been successfully cultured in vitro then global herbal medicine market uh, revenue it's a uh, huge demand all over the world and if you see 2014 to 2024 it's constantly demands are increasing both form in tablet and capsules powder extracts and even also raw material plant derived compounds in medicine 44% of new medicine medicals are based on our natural products in developed countries 25% of the prescribed medical are plant derived at least 120 plant derived compounds from 90 species are used in modern medicine and india is the pioneering of exporting those uh, medicinal plants as well as uh, using their own as a herbal medicine uh, or different forms of medical formulas uh, so um, world second or first position somewhere exporting those herbal or medicinal products if we just uh, have a look about natural cultivation of available medicinal plants and uh, few constraints of that for natural cultivation need to cultivate in a confined field or a greenhouse or an artificial shed or simulated forest conditions takes quite a long time from sowing to harvest difficult to control the disease intensive care with labor is required problem of plant based medicine production cultivation problem botanical characterization so uh, so many uh, plants and plant parts uh, i mean from the consumer end it's not possible to characterize so that adulteration with wrong plant species always mixed up field production contamination with fungi bacteria insect weeds environmental pollution contaminant uh, uh, contamination with heavy metals organics herbicides and pesticides crop nutrition altered profiles of medicinal molecules on the other hand during the manufacturing period harvest constraints all plant materials received to manufacturing facility at once drying loss of medicinal properties uh, due to the Uh, drying um, facilities or drying methods storage degradation of medicinal compounds over time uh, due to the normal storage i mean not all freezer or low temperature storage are available everywhere processing addition of fillers and binders that can alter medicinal contents marketing and distribution this advertising uh, all of we know that this uh, um, exaggerated uh, circulation or exaggeration of efficacy uh, always distributed or always publicized then if we go for uh, advancement of the cell cultures in vitro cultures for the production of active compounds uh, very easy to cultivate scale up in a conventional bioreactors not all compounds are produced in undifferentiated cells so that whole cells also i mean can be grown in the bioreactor genetically and physiologically instable possible reduction of loss of product formation throughout the time it also 
few limitations of cell culture. How about organ culture? Stable production of desired compounds in shoot roots or even embryos. Scale up in special types of bioreactors and genetically comparatively stable rather than cell culture. Nature to bioreactor. Here, this is example of a ginseng plant and culture initiation in the petri dish. I mean, uh, first of all, callus initiation from callus to adventitious root initiation, those root uh, um, uh, selected roots then goes for suspension culture in shake flask. After the culture optimization, this uh, shake flask move towards the small scale bioreactor and from the small scale bioreactor, depend on the market demands and others, go to the larger scale bioreactor. In that way, in China, in Korea, uh, they are producing uh, adventitious root, I mean, ginseng root commercially available and cheaper rather than the natural one. In our lab, uh, basically uh, what uh, we do, uh, this is a simple workflow um, in Victor chart. Uh, we are not a very big lab, but uh, we do very small scale experiment. Among them, uh, first of all, um, selected plants, uh, those plants <coughs> identify, we do identification from the botany department or national herbarium, then development of callus or cells go for plus culture we have small scale bioreactor uh, after that from bioreactor culture we harvest the fresh sample uh, we do antioxidant enzyme assay we do secondary compound analysis flavonoids phenols and then fresh sample nanoparticle synthesis uh, dried sample we do powder phytochemical analysis antimicrobial analysis anti-diabetic anti-helminthetic anti-thrombolytic analysis free radical scavenging analysis uh, we do a uh, total phenolics, flavonoids, antibacterial, antifungal, reducing power, acid, PPH, H2, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and then we do some uh, cytotoxicity assay, cancer cell line or non-cancer cell line. So um, uh, it's a simple flowchart that usually our uh, graduate and undergraduate students, their uh, regular activities they're doing. We have started uh, in silico work. Uh, first of all, we do ligand preparation, target uh, identification, protein uh, preparation and energy minimization, receptor grid generation, molecular dynamics, simulation and active site prediction, molecular docking of uh, ligand and target protein. Wow. Then we do the pharmacokinetic properties of base fit molecules. I will uh, focus here about the bioreactors and new culture systems. So many uh, people uh, in the plant biotechnology research are still uh, are not aware about this simple set of bioreactors. Maybe uh, so many labs uh, are using a fermenter type bioreactors. So those bioreactors are very uh, difficult to use and uh, not so uh, user friendly, but I am explaining here is very user friendly. Uh, and cheaper bioreactor. So what is a bioreactor system? Basically bioreactors are the vessels containing liquid medium in which the plant cells, shoots and embryos are cultured in completely submerged conditions. The use of liquid media in bioreactor has several advantages such as large number of plantlets can be easily produced and also easy to scale up Handling of culture such as inoculation or harvest is easy, saving labor and time. Forced aeration is performed, which stimulates the growth rate and ultimate biomass can be achieved. So advantages of bioreactor over a shake flask for culturing plant cells are improved control of culture's environment and the scalability. Here uh, you can see a small schematic diagram of a balloon type bioreactor. This balloon type bioreactor, uh, you are seeing this uh, glass vessel bioreactor, just it has an inlet and a gas outlet. 
and a oxygen flow, you can use uh, different types of mixing gas, or you can use direct air uh, through a just air mm, mm, pump, uh, like uh, tube uh, pump, uh, uh, direct air pump you can use. And then uh, for better control, you can use PS control box, DO control box, but usual cultivation side, small scale bioreactor, we do not use those control box. We make it very simple and uh, it's very uh, useful for any lab can try. Even uh, in our lab, we have uh, lots of limitations, but we are successfully running those small scales bioreactor without having any, um, uh, I mean, sophisticated instrumentation or other supports. Bioreactor design uh, is a fundamental um, aspect that we should care about. First of all, assessment of cell and tissue growth and production form formation. I mean, uh, uh, we uh, must have an um, uh, we must have an established uh, tissue culture system for the um, targeted plant, or which one we are trying to grow in the bioreactor. Analysis and modeling of culture dynamics, including the integration of biosynthesis and product separation. Studies of flow mixing and mass transfer between the phases in order to define criteria for bioreactor design and scale up. So uh, it would be recommended, first of all, you have to uh, uh, maintain, you have to optimize culture condition in solid culture, and then you should go for uh, shake flask uh, culture. After that, uh, when both culture uh, systems optimized and you are getting the good results, then you are recommended to move uh, forward to the bioreactor system. Medicinal and ornamental plants cultures in bioreactor. Here, this is somatic embryos in bioreactor. Uh, it was my PhD work in South Korea and uh, successfully I have tried to separate and culture different shapes of uh, um, somatic embryos in a different, different bioreactors. Here you are seeing the separated uh, um, globular heart shape, torpedo shape and cotyledonary shape uh, somatic embryos. And if you are interested, you can follow the uh, articles published uh, in the plant biotech in the journal of biotechnology and you will see how different uh, types of bioreactors uh, um, uh, are using and different shape uh, are optimizing in the different different bioreactors and their uh, secondary metabolites production so uh, uh, the, this is the five liter scale bioreactor and then 500 liter scale bioreactor and all of those are uh, bioreactors in the laboratory. So um, in the South Korean laboratory, uh, I'm sorry, I could not add uh, present pictures due to the time constraints. Maybe let's see, maybe I can have few in the later. So it was also my work. Uh, finally, uh, I did this uh, Elytrococca somatic embryos in the 500 liter bioreactors and those are the final product. Uh, and those products is really, really comparable with the small scale bioreactor. After that, uh, not only uh, somatic embryos, different, uh, I mean, shoot, multiple shoots also uh, possible to grow in the bioreactor. It would be uh, um, different ornamental plants, it would be orchids, it would be other valuable medicinal plants like uh, 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 banana uh, micro shoots or different types of shoots. Uh, so uh, using bioreactors, you are saving your time, you are saving your money, you are saving your labors, and you are getting uh, um, thousands of plants in a single bioreactor for uh, those assignment, you should use huge culture room if you go for solid culture. And then another plant also successfully grown in the bioreactor system is Rehmania uh, glutinosa. And here you see Echnesia 
angustifolia also successfully growing in the bioreactor. Uh, here, uh, Echnesia purpurea um, plants are growing in the bioreactor system. This is a Gymnema uh, sylvestri. These plants are very uh, common and popular in India. So these plants also are growing in the bioreactor very successfully in the cell culture system. So here you can see these different types of bioreactor. I already explained that uh, type optimization you must do in the small scale for the larger scale, uh, commercial scale production of large scale. You have to optimize which shape is giving you better performance on your uh, commercial product. Then you have to design your final bioreactor uh, upon uh, your uh, optimization. So here, this 500 liter bioreactor inside and outside after harvesting the product. Here, almost uh, pictures and uh, slides are taken from the South Korean, my uh, collaborator laboratories. Uh, and uh, here you will see almost work I was involved with. So those pictures are during my uh, research period in South Korea. Here, uh, you can see this uh, different uh, size, this 500 liter horizontal and vertical, then modified 1000 liter, and then 500 liter balloon type bioreactor. So these are the basically how it looks. And uh, India in uh, different aspects, those types of bioreactor are using, but I'm not sure uh, in plant cell culture or uh, plant cells um, are they are still using or not. So this is the commercial um, scale bioreactor. Uh, and uh, right now in South Korea, it's very common. Most of the cases, they are growing ginseng root. This 10 ton capacity is bioreactor. Uh, um, and then um, after end of the um, 45 days or uh, 35 days, they are harvesting 1,000 kilograms of fresh roots from each bioreactor and then those uh, dry matter is around 100 to 120 kilogram. <clears throat> so in every uh, uh, every uh, one and a half months, these four bioreactors are producing around 400 kilograms of dry weight in a laboratory room. I mean, very small area. Whereas if you can uh, achieve uh, those amounts from the natural resources, uh, at least you will take seven to eight years and huge lands are required. These are the advance, advancements of the bioreactor system for commercial production of uh, uh, different valuable medicinal plants. And the secondary metabolites and the metabolites content are the similar and uh, I will show sometimes is better uh, because you can uh, have a good control uh, over it. So um, sometimes uh, um, the natural loop you cannot get from the suspended uh, roots. So why are the products of cell suspension culture are different than natural? Little bit, I mean, size is different that size different because of lack of differentiation and organization necessary for the expression of many plant secondary metabolites is indeed needed in the suspension culture. Uh, disrupt regular metabolite pathways and result in the accumulation of precursors of desired compounds so that the uh, regular metabolite content sometimes goes for several folds uh, in the cultured uh, um, cells uh, that is comparable, uh, definitely comparable to natural. And then uh, if we uh, go for challenges, uh, what are the large scale production challenges? First of all, high initial installation costs of the bioreactor systems, and then uh, need for trained technicians. Because you are playing 1000 liter, 10,000 liter of uh, things, if it goes contaminated, then all of your efforts goes, contamination goes spoilers. So that you need trained technicians. And first of all, this uh, establishment of the bioreactor system, large bioreactor system 
uh, it do cost high initial installation cost. So the answer is also who will be working on uh, those by directors establishment. Definitely those plants have high commercial values and really, really is not available everywhere. So those initiatives will be successfully run and adjustment with the initial cost. What are other challenges? Cell culture establishment is the um, challenge. Stable cell line development, uneven production. Uh, I already told that you have to have optimized those culture system in the solid and shake culture. This reduction of biomass and then contamination. Those are the challenges. How we can overcome those challenges? This tissue culture optimization, elite genotype selection, and frequent development of new cell lines. Then uh, GCP, we should follow good cultural practice to avoid the contaminations. And then uh, metabolites enhancement strategies uh, for a regular enhancement, uh, what we can do? We can do gamma irradiation for induction of mutant line then mutant line selection and proliferation, then go for large scale culture. Directly, we do elicit uh, in the bioreactor. So rise up metabolites, we selection and cloning the candidate gene uh, and we uh, produce a transgenic line. Then those lines we can uh, produce for the secondary metabolites production. So uh, as my uh, time already told that 30 minutes, so I will try to cover um, between this time. Uh, summary, plant-based medicines are becoming increasingly important to the world health and economy. Biomass production with control the quality of plant material and time of delivery. Independence from environmental, seasonal, geographical, and political constraints control growth and development to maximize bioactive content, contents, consistent quality and yield of phytochemicals, biochemical characterization of active ingredients. Here, uh, though uh, you, those are not readable to you, but uh, uh, ginseng advantageous root, successfully we have cultured and grown in Bangladesh because Bangladesh is not a country uh, of geographical distribution where ginseng cannot grow because it uh, needs uh, this mountainous area and low temperature, but we do not have. So in collaboration with this Tungbuk National University, uh, we got some initial culture line. And then uh, from 2015, we have started maintaining those culture line and those culture line, we successfully we grow in the by we have grown in the bioreactor, and then uh, several articles already in press and uh, in production uh, for this uh, bioreactor grown uh, ginseng root in Bangladesh. So these are the uh, uh, newspaper highlights uh, for different newspapers. They are focusing those uh, experiments. Here, uh, I am uh, inviting you to have a look in the Science Portal Bangladesh uh, platform, uh, uh, where uh, we are communicating science uh, in association with the Microbiologist Society India. And we are communicating science. We are delivering the message of good science to the general people. And we are inviting all in uh, scientific mind and uh, science supporters to be support to us. And every month we are arranging different types of uh, seminars, webinars, and other campaigns uh, during uh, this uh, COVID-19 situation. And we hope we will go for, uh, I mean, physical activities uh, in the new normal areas. So if you are interested in the exploring the science and portraying the science, please do visit this science portal with the uh, platform. And we have several programs ongoing in association with Microbiology Society India. So uh, uh, for my uh, research, uh, unfortunately, uh, almost a year, all research activities, except uh, writing the articles and doing some in silico works, all, uh, I mean, lab-based work, 
works uh, are suspended uh, similar with your Indian uh, continent due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are getting uh, several funds we, we have got, or uh, we are still we are getting from Rahinagar University, Ministry of Science and Technology, Investment Corporation of Bangladesh, Ministry of Education, uh, Microbiology Society, uh, Bangladesh Medical Research Council, and University Grant Commission, Bangladesh Livestock Research Institute, and many others. So that's all uh, from my side, very um, simple and uh, short presentation. And I hope uh, I am inviting all of you to visit uh, our uh, country and my university, my lab during the new normal cessation. And uh, this is my first interaction with Telangana University. And I hope uh, we have a uh, future collaboration and cooperation uh, with your university and all of your audience. I thank you so much. Thank you for uh, your kind uh, patience and hearing. And if you have any questions, and Dr. Abdul Halim, if allow, then you can ask me any question. And I am always open to collaborate, uh, any sorts of collaboration matched with me, with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. You have uh, made a very beautiful presentation of the micropropagation of plants. Thank you very much, sir, for a short note. With a short notice, you have joined and given us such a beautiful and wonderful presentation for us. In future, we will be collaborating you for many more works. Now, I would like to request uh, our uh, next speaker, Dr. Pawan, sir. Dr. Pawan, sir, can you start uh, sharing your uh, screen? Pawan, sir. Dr. Pawan, sir. One second, I'll find out with him. He is uh, he's there, he's there, sir. Uh, can you share your screen? Uh, okay, now Professor Vidyavardhini Madam will be uh, introducing our uh, next speaker, Dr. Pawan. Over to Vidyavardhini Madam. Yeah. Thank you, Halimkar. Uh, very good morning to everyone to the second international conference on emerging trends in life sciences. I cells on virtual mode organized by the Department of Botany on 28th and 29th Jan 2021. So, uh, welcome one and all. And uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker that is Dr. Gullapalli Pawan. He is a he is uh, presently working at Central Research Laboratory, KS Hegde Medical Academy, NITE, which is a deemed university. And his research in, uh, interests include system biology and system pharmacology, uh, NGS and gene expression data analysis, molecular modeling and simulation of biological molecules, structural biology, molecular biology research collaboration, and he has collaboration with DPT Informatics Infrastructure Facility Center. And uh, he's, he has also worked from the year 2018 to 2019 in Vignan Foundation for Science and Technology and Research, Guntur. Previously, he worked from 2014 to 2015 at Chromaf Biotech Private Limited at Bangalore. And uh, he had worked uh, in the department of uh, Gnana Sahayadri Campus, Kovempu University from to, uh, 2009 to 2011. And uh, he has around 10 research publications and five publications are under review. And he has published two book chapters. He has attended four international conferences and uh, he has attended eight. Uh, and uh, 
National International Conferences and organized one conference. He has delivered four extension lectures and he has been awarded with the Inspire Fellowship with the Department of Science and Technology in the year 2011-2012 to pursue his PhD program. He was awarded a gold medal, Professor B.R. Abdul Rahim Rahman gold medal for excellence in performance in MSc Bioinformatics. Uh, scoring highest marks and getting first rank and his uh, professional growth and activities include membership with professional uh, organizations like Indian Society for Computational Biology, African Society for Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, Technical Skills and com uh, Competences include Bioinformatics Applications, Systemic bio Biology, Cytoscape, Cell Designer, Network, not network Analysis and he has uh, worked even for the NGS microarray data analysis R programming and he has worked on uh, HR package CLC workbench and many other platforms where he has shown his uh, 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 eminence in uh, various aspects of uh, biotechnology and bioinformatics uh, with this I would uh, welcome Dr. Pawan to present his presentation thank you Sir, you can start your presentation. Pawan, sir. Pawan, sir. Pawan, sir. Hello. Pawan, sir. You can start sharing your screen, sir. Pawan sir, sir you are visible, Sir, you are visible on the screen, sir. You start sharing your screen. Yeah, but I am okay. Okay, can you hear me? But I am waiting for yeah. that. I am on Zoom as well as here on phone. You are visible. Okay, okay, no problem. But actually, I was uh, muted, so I had doubt. So I was waiting for your call. Fine, anyhow. No, I okay. Have, I have made you co-host. Now you can unmute yourself. Okay, okay, fine, fine, no problem. Fine. Good morning, one and all. So welcome for the session. So today, uh, <coughs> it's a great opportunity for me to speak in this session. So I will speak about uh, the systems biology to precision medicine. So an approach uh, to uncover the molecular footprints and compact uh, some of the infectious diseases. So here we will speak about uh, this, especially the prospectives and what are the applications of the systems biology towards developing a or towards improving the precision medicine. So in that background, what is actually the precision medicine? So it is an uh, attempt to stratify the patients into response classification. So using the multiple types of data, such as it may be of a genetic or a genomic uh, screens or it may be a sequencing or the blood and the urine or the stool tests, even the data from the medicinal history 
or even it may be the data of the demographic data. So all such type of the data which we'll use here in order to develop or in order to answer the question such as of a precision medicine. What is the rationale of this uh, precision medicine or what is the underlying rationality between uh, behind this precision medicine? So it is to recognize the fact that it vary the back, it vary the medicine will vary depending on the back background and as well as the disparate environmental factors where the human population is going to be residing and what are the underlying risks or the impacts uh, that are responsible for uh, subsets of the individuals under the therapy uh, therapeutic uh, manifestations. So this is because of uh, biological pathways so which monitor the entire system system means uh, in our concept here biologically we can, uh, we can say it as uh, a cell any type of a cell so even a cell or a tissue so where uh, we will consider the system it is a combination of genes and even products of the genes and which they monitor the pathways so and the functions which are regulated by the genes and the products of the genes of course the products of the genes we consider them as uh, most commonly as the proteins so in the basic of these things several complex diseases like even it may be of a cancer or some of the metabolic disorder diseases like uh, diabetes mellitus or even uh, some of the infectious diseases like uh, hiv and even the most uh, recent pandemic that is of covid 19 so all are results of the uh, they result in the disruption of uh, several types of pathways uh, that results in the disease status of an individual person so as we know that uh, we have seen it the uh, covid 19 the effect of the covid 19 so that uh, uh, there is no prescribed medicine, even though some of the vaccination has been arrived now, but there is no a particular medicine so that each of the individual patient or we can take an individual uh, host, it differs or his response will be differing um, based upon whatever the strategies or the pathway manifestations that are going to be occurred uh, due to the infection that has been raised. So by underlying all these uh, perturbations so you see a small schematic represented what is this personalized medicine actually so whatever all the different types of data or it may be if a genomics data or a proteomics data or epigenomic data metabolic data all such type of omics datas what we have so all the profiles of the omics that we consider to develop an uh, or that will be analyzed by using some of the strategies like systems biology applications or even bioinformatics or even biomathematical modeling. That means modeling some of the systems by the mathematical approaches or even biostatistical theories. So all these uh, approaches, they will be used for the integration of the data. That means the transcriptomic data or even the genomic data, proteomic data, whatever the data, it may be, omics data. So that will be integrated analyzed and it will be interpreted why it needed to be interpreted so that for to develop a complex disease and network so here comes the concept of the network biology so it plays a very important role in a, a modern medicine where a network medicine or a network biology so that helps to develop a personalized medicine so that a patient specific interactions how the particular gene level or even it may be of a uh, protein level or it may be of at an population level or it may be at an evolutionary level so all type of interactions we can develop and we can say uh, or we can develop a target based upon that particular or we can treat that particular uh, therapeutic uh, we can develop a therapeutic assistance for that particular patient based upon his response individual person's responses so such all things will be preferred here so one of the key guidelines, oh sorry, one of the key guidelines uh, that is a principle of the systems biology that we use is the emergence or the expression of the system's wide behavior or the property that cannot be, that cannot be predicted based upon through the knowledge of any or all of the components participating of the system studies in isolation. So by 
understanding these type of links that means by taking the expression profiles of a gene by taking the expression profiles of any protein or uh, sorry expression profile of any mirnas or even sirnas or any type of mrnas so like that whatever all the expression profiles we can take them that a transcript of data or even the metabolic pathway data so such type of uh, data will be integrated to study the behavior so that means especially here the dynamic behavior so the dynamic behavior can be assessed that means in a system no biological molecule is of a stable it will be in dynamic nature in reality but when we study it will be in of a stable or we try to attain its stability so but is a naturally they will be in a dynamic nature so we on all respective of all these aspects we try to analyze the entire system here so in or it implies the methodology for uh, defining human diseases from a network that means we construct and just i will show in the forthcoming slides how uh, a network presumes to be so just you can see here some few examples that i have given that is a modular network of the diseases how suppose if you take the classic uh, mendelian disorder like of a single phenotype so a disorder with a single phenotype so here this is one of the network and uh, <clears throat> just a simple word i will clarify you before illustrating what is this so in a network we consider each of this circle as one node and the connection between what the line connection we have exist between each of the node we call it as an edge that is a um basic theory that exist in network biology or even the graph theory also so here each node is connected with a single edge or it may be of a multiple edges or our example different type of examples i illustrated here so like for a single phenotype t represents the disease g represents the gene and e represents the environment and i represents uh, like uh, the intermediate phenotype that arises and p, p represents the pathological or pathological phenotype that is outcoming suppose if there is one gene so that gene so it will it it collaboratively or it will respond in such a manner to outcome one of the pathological feature so it has to interact with the environmental factors and the disease responsible factors and even it may be the uh, intermediate uh, some of the phenotypic features it will respond and ultimately it, resists, uh, it uh, results in the development of the pathological phenotype so like that when you take uh, so multiple phenotypes a single particular gene it may have multiple diseases so that means it may arise n number of diseases or depending upon the environmental factors it has and which responses for the different type of intermediate uh, phenotypes and ultimately leading to the number of uh, phenotypes that is pathological phenotypes so hence uh, i represent here by a pn so and if you take the multiple uh, phenotypes and as well as the multiple genotypes when you consider here so there you can see here so that uh, so two different types that is two different type of genes that may result in a single phenotype that means two different type of intermediate phenotype that may be resulted and that ultimately results to one type of pathological phenotype or two type of disease that is comorbidity we can say here some of the diseases which are of comorbid so such type of uh, illustrations we can develop here like that few all different type of uh, different of environmental diseases for every uh, type of diseases here we have some of the um, strategy to understand the systems level that means the gene and even the protein and Co uh, correlating with the environmental factors that are going to affect for that particular diseases to be explored out so such all type of analysis can be done by using this systems biology and in this perspective one more example i try to illustrate here so this is simple once we constructed a network that is a, a network uh, which is responsible for a disease uh, modifying uh, modifying the gene network so that is a network of the pulmonary arterial uh, hypertension disease when you see different colors of this one see different colors of nodes are represented with the edges that have been collected uh, connected between the each of the nodes so each 
colored nodes they represent the pathophenotypes or even the environmental uh, determination which are responsible for that uh, alteration in that particular gene that may responsible for again in the intermediate phenotype ultimately this intermediate phenotype that may result in some of the pathophenotype so such all type of uh, things can be analyzed here so so this is one of the importance or the very uh, basic thing that, that is required to analyze the systems biology in application to the precision medicine so here a molecular information leads to so so the data so nowadays whatever the high throughput technology which has been resulted in sequencing that is of ngs or even the data which is available from the mass spectrometry uh, all these such type of data that is omics data that as i already said you that i said a genomic data or a transcriptomics data proteomics data metabolomics or any type of lipidomics or uh, neutromics like all type of omics data that can be used to construct or to generate these type of uh, systems network where we can analyze it or correlate with the different environmental conditions internal cellular conditions so ultimately from bench to bedside how and uh therapeutic can be developed for a specific or an individual or a special uh, what we called as a uh, personalized medicine can be developed so this is one more uh, image that illustrates you how the approach goes so whatever the data which is present obtained from a human that is of a cell or it may be based upon the tissue or the data which is obtained from the different body fluids like it may be saliva serum plasma or urine from there what we all the different type of data we can uh, get it and from that type of data also we can integrate all such type of data here to develop a personalized omics profile of the individual person first we will develop a profile for any individual person so after developing that individual profile so then we go for identification of the uh, crucial nodes or the crucial proteins or the genes which are responsible for monitoring the entire system of that individual person so hence targeting that particular gene or that particular uh, uh, protein so that will lead to treat the individual person more effectively than the generalized medicine so coming to here there is one of the illustration again uh, is recently uh, in the may or in the june month uh, this paper has been uh, uh, developed by zon et al so yeah. so where they try to develop uh, personalized medicine for this uh, they proposed a systems uh, approach to develop a personalized medicine for this uh, human covid virus so where um, they took uh, all the, the they generated an interaction network uh, of the host uh, or whatever the covid proteins which will interact with the host proteins suppose host is nothing but here we will consider it as a human being so all the proteins which are present in a human which are um, communicating or which have been uh, responding towards the viral proteins so that network they have constructed and based upon that network they identified the crucial proteins that is the they developed a network and once they developed a network some mathematical uh, by using some of the calculations they found which are the important proteins in the host so that are responding towards the viral attack or the viral towards the viral uh, proteins so then what is the interaction between those two proteins and once they identified the targets in the viral proteins and the human so they go on for the drug repurposing so where those drugs are the existing drugs which are already present they can be used for the new therapeutic uh, which may have the new therapeutic benefits they can be utilized here so then uh, they go on with the enrichment of those particular genes which are responsible so like that uh, when the drug induced gene how it will respond and when the uh, viral induced gene how it will respond so that profile they analyzed and ultimately with the network to construct that is a combination of different drugs they made that will treat some of the targets in this viral infection that's what the hypothesis they made it so that is a completely a computational approach where we will hypothesize so which can be validated further uh, by some of the in vitro or in vivo analysis which is must and should required so here we can see a more simple thing where 
how the different drugs uh, so they are uh, reacting or they are interacting with the different type of viruses so like a uh, sars cov sars cov2 or even maybe mers or it may be of uh, ibv or it may be of uh, mhv so different type of uh, viruses so they will respond for different type of uh, drugs that can be utilized to treat so the drugs which are already used for the mers or the sars or any other virus which have been already developed so that can be have a beneficiary uh, effects on the present sars cov so that we can treat so such type of hypothesis they have developed based upon this uh, systems biology applications so recently uh, in that same perspective we developed or we analyzed some of the important uh, how the host proteins and the viral proteins that are going to be interacted and that interaction network is further analyzed so which is the very crucial protein which is present in the virus which can interact with the host so that by targeting that particular viral protein so we can part of or we can manifest uh, the proximity of uh, the effect of the disease like that an hypothesis we developed so based upon the, that hypothesis so we constructed one network so i will make you clear first so here we used the set of genes via the sars cov genes not covid 19 genes we used so because when we developed it is uh, sars covid 19 genes are not available on that later the proteomics entire set of data is available but when we developed this interaction network then we had only the sars cov genes and uh, all the set of sars cov genes here we try to represent it in a this uh, image as an orange color and all the green color nodes that represent the host proteins so the entire set of host proteins and the entire set of viral proteins they we developed an interaction network how they are going to interact with one another or suppose a simple example suppose if i take spike glycoprotein that is a spike protein of the virus how it is going to interact with the different type of host proteins or the host genes so here first we developed a joint network and based upon that uh, we developed so the joint network is nearly consists of 374 nodes which have or connected with the nearly 5800 and something edges so some parameters that we analyze here that is of clustering coefficient average number of neighbors so here some brief thing i can give you an idea so the clustering coefficient nothing but suppose if i have a node so this particular node this particular node so how much cluster means a group so with how many number of neighboring proteins or neighboring nodes it can make a group so that value will give you the that is individual node and when you take the summation so it will give the coefficient of that particular nodes so then coming to the average number of average number of neighbors so how many neighbors so suppose on some of the protein some of the viral proteins they may have interacted with a single host protein or some of the proteins they may have a multiple so a number of uh, host proteins to be interacted so such type of uh, interactions we will usually or such type of uh, number will give us the average number of neighbors for each node and uh, the distance or we will call the network uh, density so how dense the network it is there and the shortest path so shortest path is nothing but the distance between the two neighbors neighboring proteins so that if there are a b c proteins how a b c d so how shortestly we can connect a and d so such type of hypothesis we will use and we calculate the shortest path and characterizing the path length what is the length of that path so based upon all these topological features we identify further some of the proteins as the top protein so in this hypothesis we identified this sars glycoprotein so this sars glycoprotein is a well established target so it has been uh, identified and it has been uh, explained by several works so that the uh, glycoprotein or the spike glycoprotein would act as a good target to treat the sars cov so this uh, sars uh, glycoprotein uh, sorry spike glycoprotein so it actually uh, binds with the ace protein of the human so that means it acts like an receptor ace is another receptor in the human so that ace 
will binds with the spike glycoprotein so that initiates the viral entry into the host cell so such type of things when we enriched that means gene ontology terms so which are all the different pathways that are going to be enriched or different biological processes uh, that are going to be enriched and molecular functions that are going to be enriched by these set of uh, viral and as well as host genes we find uh, some of the important thing here that you can see this is when we find this uh, some host target called sorry a viral target protein that is of a uh, spike glycoprotein so we identified the first neighbors in the entire set of this uh, joint network we identified which are the human or the host proteins which act as uh, the first neighbors for this spike glycoprotein so based upon uh, that background hypothesis or the theory so we identified different type of uh, proteins which are acting as a first neighbors not secondary neighbors the first neighbors so here we found that different type of proteins so that uh, along with the ace2 so we find one more type of protein that is called as a cle c4m so this cle c4m it especially uh, participate in the immunoregulatory uh, interactive section between the lymphocytes and non lymphocyte cells uh, in the host cell so there this particular spike glycoprotein it interacts with ace2 and as well as this particular cle c4 yeah so the first and the second so that hypothesis are with uh, which are the background uh, molecular pathways that are residing behind this infection so such type of all these things uh, we have hypothesis here and then moving to further so based upon this as well established we find what are the background or what is the uh, uh, pathways that this spike glycoprotein is going to interrupt in the host by studying all these things uh, based upon that uh, target protein so we tried further for this uh, uh, drug repurposing so that we collected by taking this spike protein as a target we collected nearly 55 uh, drugs from the some of the publicly available database and we gone with uh, multiple uh, docking devices the first step is a blind dock so where the drug repurposing will go so we screen all of these 55 drugs so in identify which are the top drugs so that they can exactly bind it to the binding pocket so we concentrate here actually i make it clear that we concentrate the um, the reason where the human ac2 protein and as well as the spike protein so that is going to interact so that interaction core part that we are going to be targeting here not even uh, specifically the spike protein or not even the specifically human ac2 protein so the binding uh, reason where these two are going to that reason we are going to concentrate here so in that perspective we find top five proteins in that uh, pocket we find a type uh, different type of uh, five different molecules that are going to bind in this particular reason so further we analyzed or we named them as a s5 spike uh, uh, s5 s21 s43 s54 s55 and to comparison we took one standard so the standard drug which acts on the spike protein we compared that with this standard so when we see the binding energies of all these we find that we find that uh, so the particular spike 54 this ligand it find to be having the most lowest binding energy the lowest binding energy and the next priority goes with the spike 55 so the number of hydrogen bonds it has so the three and the maximum two hydrogen bonds uh, respectively we have and coming to the hydrogen bond interactions that we find so it is of uh, asparagine and even uh, um, arsenine and even the glycogen so like that we find different type of uh, amino acids which are participating in the formation of the hydrogen bond interactions and the hydrophobic reasons uh, which they have been so these hydrophobic interactions are very much important in the docking approach as we know it very well so because they are the most strongest interaction that we found when compared to the other so we prefer that uh, hydrophobic interactions and Moving to the next step. so all these different uh, type of uh, binding interactions you can see that uh, S54 and even the standard and uh, you can see how the interaction is going to be our uh, S54 is going to be binding pocket where it is interacting 
and even this standard and when we come across the other like s54 how it is going to interact and even the s55 how it is going to interact with the different uh, reasons with the different type of interactions that is of bonding interactions uh, between the host or the binding pocket residues and as well as the um, ligand molecule so further once we find this top five and in the top five as i illustrated so the s55 and as well as s54 we find these two uh, compounds to have maximum binding energy in the binding pocket even when compared to the standard we find it is a good so then we want to see the stability or we want to further uh, see the stability of our, that interaction how it is for that we went for the molecular dynamic simulations where very simple uh, analysis of the molecular dynamic interaction uh, simulations that is of uh, uh, root mean square deviation and root mean square uh, fluctuations and some hydrogen bond interactions so these graphs uh, will represent uh, the rmsd plot of the spike glycoprotein and as well as uh, the, the complex of the spike glycoprotein and this uh, human uh, AC, uh, ac2 binding receptor so that in complex with uh, our particular uh, compounds so one is of s54 and one is of uh, s55 and one more is of a standard so the three colors uh, respectively that is of a green or it may be of a red and as well as the black they respectively represent uh, such type of first one is ss that is a standard and the red color it will represent you the 54 and whereas the blue uh, green color it will represent s55 so we find from the initial uh, course of the simulation starting with a few fluctuations in the initial time but we run the entire simulation for nearly up to 300 nanoseconds using amber tool so here uh, out of the towards this uh, in respect of this entire time duration of the simulation we find maximum of uh, the two molecules uh, such as of s54 and s55 we find almost they are stable but uh, with a few small fluctuation in the s54 at the end of the simulation but it found to be stabilized further later so this confirms that uh, the binding of our molecules with the um, whole, uh, even uh, the binding pocket of that particular uh, target so it is more stabilized and further uh, root mean square fluctuations of the that is of rmsds between these uh, uh, of the complexes we have analyzed such as of the standards and as well as so when we see the fluctuations here also the three different type of complexes have been fluctuated and we find a, a small amount of uh, stability so which comes uh, between the 300 to 400 nanoseconds we find a small amount of stability here and uh, finally coming to number of hydrogen bonds uh, that are going to be formed and that are going to be um, disrupted during the entire time duration of the simulation so of the complex that has been formed we found maximum stability in all the two types of the ligands such as of uh, s54 and as well as standard but when coming to uh, s55 there is a small variation fluctuation of the bond formation in the initial phase but uh, later it uh, attained the stability of the bond, hydrogen bond formation later after uh, some 300 or 350 nanoseconds it found a normal stability and in this perspective further further validation of this simulation we joined with uh, this mmpbsa and mmgmsa so where we check whether the binding energy the stability of the binding energy is so this uh, binding energy analysis it resulted as uh, to find the some of the proteins or some of the proteins or the residues which contribute majorly for the bond formation with the residues so the proline so the proline of uh, 359 of the that particular uh, binding pocket so it contributes majorly towards the binding of this standard and whereas the same protein it contributes majorly towards the spike uh, s54 molecule when compared to the standard the contribution energy is more when compared is lower more lower when compared to the standard and where we see about this one so the entire residue is going to be changed here in s55 so this uh, threonine has uh, got the first place which is burning so like that each individual residues of the active pocket so how they contribute towards binding towards the ligand molecule so and how far they are stable 
how much the energy is being contributed by these residues towards binding to that particular molecules that will be analyzed here and a small uh, overlapping representation that we have done so the common residues which have found to be overlap in all the three uh, the the three residues which uh, interact or which contribute maximum in binding towards this uh, binding pocket or uh, sorry towards these the three different type of uh, ligands so those the three uh, molecules that are the those such type of residues that we have been highlighted here in this uh, representation and finally so all these results uh, that demonstrated that a ligand that is of uh, s54 and as well as s55 so they show a good activity towards binding towards uh, the spike glycoprotein and ribosomal binding domain of the ac protein of the human ribosomal binding domain that is a domain which is present in the ac2 of the human and the spike protein in that uh, intermediate or in that interaction uh, reason so these uh, two compounds they are going to bind and show uh, the disruption or uh, they they show the disruption of the uh, spike protein uh, to bound with the more strongly towards this uh, ribosomal binding protein domain of the ac2 human uh, stobolan enzyme so this shows that when compared to this uh, s55 and s54 so we hypothesize further uh, this s54 so this uh, provides uh, or uh, this uh, shows more activity that is more stability and lower binding free energies uh, towards binding to the spike protein so in this way computationally we hypothesize so this particular uh, ligands even it may be s54 so it may act as a good therapeutic molecule so that uh, it disrupts uh, the bonding between the ac2 that is the host that is the human uh, receptor ac2 human ac2 protein uh, domain human ac2 proteins domain or the, the ribosomal binding domain which is present in the ac2 so that domain and even this uh, glycoprotein so these uh, two reasons uh, cannot be on so that in that particular junction this particular uh, ligand molecule can go and act so that that disrupts uh, the uh, interaction between these two uh, proteins so that it can be act as a good therapeutic molecule which can be further validated by some on the some of the in vitro or even in the in vivo hypothesis so altogether to summarize for a small computational study so we say a systems biology so even though a uh, spike glycoprotein which has been well established target we agree with it but uh, whatever the systems approach that we followed so it also hypothesizes the same thing as it has some crucial pathways uh, that are going to be participating uh, in responsible for the uh, pathogenicity of the that particular covid 19 so due to that that particular target can be used for the therapeutic development so in that respect you we gone with the developing some of the personalized medicine that is by constructing a network and see the properties the topological features of those thing and then based upon the target by we gone with the structure based ligand design approach where uh, we took nearly 55 ligand molecules and we screened them that is a virtual screen we done by the docking so the first is a blind docking and the second one is a respective docking so where we find the top 5 and those top 5 compounds are further screened by the simulations that is molecular dynamic simulations where how far these binding is stable with the uh, corresponding target molecule and once we found that lastly we screened with the maximum two molecules and and how this binding energy or out of these two molecules which are the which is the molecule which has the highest contribution of the binding energies so in that perspective s54 yes, molecule so that we identify as a major uh, ligand molecule or important ligand molecule that has a good therapeutic effect so which uh, we plan further to hypothesize it uh, by some of the in vitro and as well as in vivo models so in this uh, course uh, thank you one and all any questions Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, beautiful presentation of systems biology and precision medicine. So this will be a new uh, uh, sort of science what we have witnessed today, and uh, we feel very opportunistic to get the information on current latest developments in the 
science of systems biology and precision precision medicine in making uh, the new sort of drugs and new sort of medicines and uh, face new sort of disease challenges to humans so with these few words i would like to uh, thank on behalf of department of telangana university for your kind uh, cooperation and presentation in our meeting thank you so much sir we will be seeing you soon again in some of the few uh, new assignments whenever we uh, plan so thank you so much thank you so much sir uh, for your uh, presentation now i will request our next speaker uh, naik sir dr naik sir to uh, uh, share his screen dr naik sir नायक सर कैमरा ऑन करिए ओके ओके गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग एक सेकेंड सर मुझे आपका इंट्रोडक्शन देने दीजिए देन यू कैन स्टार्ट योर थिंग ओके Uh, it is my proud privilege to introduce our uh, next speaker, Dr. J. C. Nayak, senior scientist in horticulture and head medicinal and aromatic plant research station, Rajendra Nagar, Hyderabad. Sri Konda Lakshman, Telangana State Horticulture University, and uh, today he is going to speak us or share us some of the concepts that is objectives and importance of medicinal and aromatic plants. Dr. J. C. Nayak is M.Sc. in Horticulture and Ph.D. in Horticulture. He has experience of research and teaching near about 16 years, and he has published more than 15 research papers. And he is a real expertise in the medicinal plants. And now, sir, will be sharing us uh, his talk. Over to Nayak, sir. Dr. Nayak, sir, you can start sharing your PowerPoint. Shall I share your PowerPoint? Yes, sir. You can share, sir. Okay. You can share my PowerPoint. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Myself, Dr. Jira Naik, Senior Scientist, Horticulture, and head of the Medicine Arbadi. Station, Sri Konda Lakshman Horticulture University. So, good morning, everybody. Now I am presenting the on scope and importance and objectives of the medicinal and aromatic plants. Now coming to the scope, actually there is no plant in the world which does not have the medicinal properties. My properties and the medicinal plants are accessible. affordable and culturally appropriate source of the pharmacy shuni and the more than 50 more than the 80% of asia population as per the world health organization sir next sir next skip can you share my one second हेलो हेलो कान सब Yes. Hello. Your next slide has come, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, the there is every sector can be grown by the uh, as per the institution development. As is like our medicine plant sector can be improved if the agriculture support agencies would come forward to help the 
strengthen the medicinal plants growers and if the research institutes like our station medicinal plant research station like university would help the plant growers by improving their basic knowledge about the cultivation practices by giving the different uh, training programs and uh, exposure visits so this is our status next slide sir uh, next slide sir the status of the medicinal and aromatic plants here the india has the probably the oldest richest and most reserved cultural <clears throat> tradition in the use of medicinal plants as per the indian council of forestry research and education we have established herbaria and medicinal plant gardens and developed a package of for cultivation of economically important medicinal plants with modern techniques including tissue culture lab and the genetic engineering cultivation practices and the use of medicinal aromatic plants and uh, and every uh, biotechnology so, so various institution under icfre are working on specific species for the conservation of the germplasm the some of the medicinal aromatic plants undergone undergone and uh, treated for the several decay these are the acarus calamus Cobbia vitae, Dendrobium, and Saraca, Ashoka, and Gloria, <coughs> Gloria the superba. And the, one of the earliest texts of the Indian medicine, the Charaka Sumita, about 1000 BC, mentions the use of 2000 vegetable herb medicinal plants. Over 17,000 different species of the plants found in the different ecosystems are said to be useful for the medicinal plant purpose in our country. India has been a traditional exporter of medicinal plants for the past several decades and ranked as the one of the foremost supplier of medicinal plants in the world. And the age-old Indian system of medicine has been neglected mainly because of the rapid expansion of the allopathic system of the treatment. That's why the, some of the medicinal plants <coughs> undergone so not available in our country. Next slide, sir. And the, so the, here, importance of the medicinal plants. It has yeah. India has one of the richest to ethnobotanical tradition in the world, within <clears throat> with more than seven thousand species of plants found in the different agro ecosystems and used by the various indigenous systems of the medicinal and industries. Here, the diverse agroclimatic situation in the region offers excellent scope for the growing the different horticulture crops like fruit crops, vegetables, spice and plantain scrub. Medicine plants and aromatic plants also. And the medicine and aromatic plants are constitute a major segment of the flora, which provide a raw material for use in the pharmaceuticals and cosmetics and drug industries. The systems include Ayurveda. It, the, the, this medicinal aromatic plant systems are available in the Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, and the many other indigenous practices. More than 9,000 native plants have established and recorded curative properties, and about the 1,500 species are known for their aroma and flavor. So here, 9,000 9, native plants are medicinal aromatic plants, and 15,000 species are for our uh, plantation are the aromatic plants. And over 95% of the plants used by the herbal or the pharmaceutical industry is collected from the wild source only. Even the <clears throat> alarming rate of the loss of biodiversity due to other well-known factors, the industrialization collection of the wild medicinal plants, there is a real danger of the extraction of the many of the, our, our medicinal plant species. The aromatic and medicinal plants used as the patachili, stevia, citronella, cinnamon are also being grown in the mild tropical areas, that is, plain and foothills of the state. Temperature and the alpine zones accommodate the cultivation of the geranium, Texas, gingering, saffron, etc. <clears throat> and all the known ones for the toxic orchids and the medicinal plant aromatic plants. Next slide, sir. Medicinal plants are the pl those plants which in the secondary metabolites 
are potential source of drugs. The secondary metabolites include the alkaloids, glycosides, fumarates, flavonoids, and the steroids. So a considerable number of medicinal plant as per the World Health Organization, what is the medicinal plant? A medicinal plant is the pl any plant which in one or more of its organ or parts contain substance that can be used for the therapeutic purpose or which are precursor for the chemopharmaceutical semi-synthesis. We can define that what is the medicinal aromatic plants. So among the all the various medicinal plants, the great demand in our country abroad are the opium, poppy, tropana, alkaloid bearing plants, serpagenic bearing yam, sinna, silum, hust, sheaves, shinnakos, ipeka. The ancient Indian system of medicines is predominantly a plant-based material, medical making use of most of our native plants. Among the various plants is great demand in the country abroad. Are, this is next step, sir. As well as India is already a major exporter of medicine plant, it is estimated that 86 crores worth of the raw materials and drugs from the medicine plants are exported from the India. So plant parts like leaf, bark, root, seeds, used in the medicinal aromatic from the medicinal plant. Enterprises such as the large scale cultivation as an agro industry. Marketing of the dried plant parts in national and international markets, establishing a market networks can be, these are the seed. Production and marketing of the quality seeds of the high yielding varieties from the seed companies. Herbal chocolates, sweets, sugar free sweets, drinks are the being marketed in internationally. Use of herbal extracts in the food products is a not new in our idea. Then the, so coming to the important and export of the medicinal and aromatic plants, India and the China are the two major producing <coughs> countries having the 40% of the global diversity, biodiversity and availability of the rare species. Here, China and the US have the highest potential in the leading medicine aromatic plus world important market. Singapore, Japan, Germany, Malaysia, and the US are the identified as the five countries with medicine aromatic plants highest importing advantages. In India, there are 880 medicine plant species involved in all India trade. Of these 48 species are exported and, the, and about 42 species are imported. The Ministry of Environment and Forest Government has revealed that there, there are 8,000 8, species of medicinal plants grown in the country. So coming from the foreign trade in the medicinal aromatic plants, medicinal aromatic plants are produced and offered in a wide variety of products from crude materials to processed and packaged products like pharma, pharmaceuticals, herbal remedies, teas, Spirit, cosmetics, sweets, dietary supplements, and insecticides. The data has been extracted from the publication of the Department 291 of the Commercial Intelligence. The statistics that the com <clears throat> companies of 13 crude drugs and 14 alkaloids, salt, and other derivatives, three <clears throat> perfumery materials, 11 aromatic chemicals, and 23 essentials. essentials are health regionals. Basic chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and cosmetics export promotion council has brought out report on the present status and the future projections of the foreign trade on some selected mission plants only. In spite of its vast natural resource, the country is not at itself reliant in the medicinal and aromatic plants. A <clears throat> Puzzle of the data shows that the 60 to 90 percent of the export trade in the respective categories is restricted to one to two select commodities only. That's uh, for example, say, silum and senna in the drug fruits, quinine supplement in the alkaloids, salts and other derivatives, 
ಕೆಲಸರಿ ಇಂದ ಫಾರ್ಮಸಿ ಮೆಡಿಕಲ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸ್ಯಾಂಡಲ್ ವುಡ್ ಇನ್ ಆಯಿಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಲೈಫ್ಸ್ ಕ್ಯಾಟಗರಿ ಸೊ ಇಯರ್ ರಾಜಸ್ಥಾನ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಹೈಯೆಸ್ಟ್ ಇಯರ್ ಏರಿಯಾ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರೂ ದ ಏರಿಯಾ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಅರೋಮ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ ಪ್ಲಾಂಟ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಕಲ್ಟಿವೇಶನ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಅರೋಮ್ಯಾಟಿಕ್ ಕ್ರಾಪ್ಸ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಟೂ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಹೆಕ್ಟೇರ್ಸ್ ಡ್ಯೂರಿಂಗ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫೈವ್ ಟು ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಟು ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ತ್ರೀ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ನೈನ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಹೆಕ್ಟೇರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ಸಿಮಿಲರ್ಲಿ ದ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಟೂ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಟೂ ಟನ್ಸ್ ಟು ಇನ್ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫೈವ್ ಟು ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ಸ್ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫೈವ್ ಫೈವ್ ಹಂಡ್ರೆಡ್ ಟನ್ಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಅನ್ ಆನ್ಯುವಲ್ ಗ್ರೋತ್ ರೇಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೂ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಸೆವೆನ್ ಫೈವ್ ಪರ್ಸೆಂಟ್ ಪರ್ ಆನ್ಯೂಮ್ among the state rajasthan is the having the highest area under the medicinal aromatic plant crops with a share of 56% of the person and followed by the uttar pradesh 25% in case of production madhya pradesh ranks first with a share of 44% and rajasthan ranks second with a share of 19% the total exports of herbal raw drugs include extracts was estimated and it was 134500 metric tons and the consumption demand of medicinal plants by domestic herbal industry was estimated at 195000 metric tons here karnataka is the one of the most immensely potential state for the cultivation of the medicinal plants and it is the largest producer of ashwagandha which was used in the many medicinal medicinal plants that is 61.55 65% and the next is amla that is 9.4% sandalwood 9.41% and producer of other oil likes lemon grass citron citron and lav <coughs> palm rose jasmine tuberose and vetiver in the substantial qualities and next is the Rajasthan having the highest area under this crop with a share of 56% and average of 3,3630 hectares then the followed by the Uttar Pradesh 25% In case of production of Madhya Pradesh already I have told So these are the uses of the medicinal aromatic plants I have given the different medicinal plants and their uses Here sir can we uh, yes this, this ashwagandha it can be reduce the anxiety and stress help so number of uh, crops are given have so aloe vera and uh, aloe vera this is the uh, used for the accelerate the healing burns reduce the dental problems helps state state canker scores gets the sn reduce the constipation these are the and the chandachuralu seed extracts are used as the antidermic dietary and phrenic and dula gondi mukuna improved sleep and gurigindalu pinus herbs used for the pinus herbs used only after the detoxifying purpose henna you all we know we use for the hide hair dyes and hair care products isab gol used for the treating the constipation and effect for the weight loss calmed used for the stomach anti therapeutic anti inflammatory and promote the digestion digestive system and these are the all the karakaya kasturi bedda and kunkud kaya mint nannari neeli noni and the sabja black seed sada paku karpura tulsi lavanga tulsi palma rosa antibacterial so these are the uses of the medicinal and the aromatic plants by this i conclude that so so, so in india most of the cultivated india has very strong traditional health care practices that are represented by the classical system of the medicine like ayurveda siddha yunani so the major commonly <clears throat> commonality of this indian classical and the folk healthcare tradition is the their dependence upon the raw material derived from a large diversity of the plant species which is estimated to be a, about 6500 species and the india is a blessed with the varied climatic condition which is suitable for growing desirable medicinal aromatic crops 
but not most much expansion of the cultivation of these crops was observed some of the medicinal and aromatic plants were found in the western and eastern parts which is known for the biodiversity diversity and some species are in the edge of the extinction so by this i conclude my um, session thank you khan sahab for giving my opportunity thank you very much the who are involved in this team thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir for your presentation and enlightening us about the medicinal plants and their uses um, uh, it is uh, our pleasure to have you in this uh, international conference thank you very much for uh, presenting uh, your uh, ideology on medicinal plants thank you so much sir now i would like to request our next speaker uh, dr prashant singh just now dr prashant singh has joined uh, dr prashant uh, dr prashant are you there dr prashant dr prashant are you able to listen to me can you start your video dr prashant dr mahesh can i request you yeah dr prashant has joined dr prashant can you please uh, unmute yourself hello yes yes can you start your screen yes 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 uh good morning uh, one and all uh, my slides are visible to all of all the participants can able to see my slides yeah yeah we can see your slides one second okay one second one second okay vidya ma'am vidya ma'am can you start his introduction ashtan kumar's introduction vidya ma'am i made you co-host i don't know which one is your vidya vardhini madam it's okay sir no problem uh, i can continue with my presentation Let one second. He, she has some I mean, some network issues. It seems. Yes, sir. Okay, quickly, I'll give the introduction of Dr. Prashant Kumar Singh. Dr. Prashant Kumar Singh is assistant professor, Department of Biotechnology, Mizoram University, a Central University, Panch. Pachunga University College Campus. College yes. Campus, College Wens, Aizwal, uh, Mizoram. Uh, uh, he is a plant biologist, efficient in building uh, own research ideas as well as relationship with juniors and senior colleagues. He uh, is. He has. Uh, his research experience is uh, uh, from January 2018 to 19 as postdoc fellow uh, in Department of Vegetables and Field Crops. Institute of Plant Sciences Agriculture Research Organization, Volkani Center, Israel, and uh, he has ex a postdoc fellow at Key Laboratory of Plant Cell Biology, Henan University, China. He has a postdoctoral research associate, Molecular Biology Section, Department of Botany, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. 
He is assistant professor in the Mizoram University since 2019. He uh, he is assistant professor Department of Botany in Indira Gandhi National University, uh, Amar Kantak, India. He was teaching associate Department of Botany, Mahila Mahavidyalaya, uh, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. He is a doctorate in uh, Botany, uh, specialization uh, proteomics and functional genomics of stress response. Uh, his thesis title was Cadmium Induced Changes in the Proteome of Three Anabina Species and Molecular Characterization of ALR2954 uh, for decoding its uh, role in abiotic stress management in E. coli. Uh, he uh, completed his uh, PhD from uh, Department of Botany, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. Uh, his uh, supervisor is renowned personality, Professor L.C. Rai. And he is ma master uh, from Banaras uh, Department of Botany, Banaras Hindu University. He is bachelor from Uday Pratap Autonomous College, uh, Varanasi. And uh, his publication he published his articles uh, with his publication H index is 14 and citation is 435. Uh, He has contributed uh, to number of book chapters uh, as well as research papers. He has uh, published uh, near about three. He has edited three books. Uh, among them, advances in cyanobacterial biology by Elsevier Academic Press, and uh, he has uh, under process uh, one more book that is advances in cyanobacterial biology second edition, which is in press, and uh, he has. Uh, Alphabet of plant responses to stresses. Uh, understanding of epigenetic and omics perspective is under uh, pub under publishing house. He was uh, served Young Scientist Research Fellowship awarding. Um, he was uh, research associate award by CSIR New Delhi during 2013 and 14. He was senior research fellow in the Department of Botany, Banaras Hindu University. He was. Uh, uh, he has qualified his CSIR net exam in 2008. He was uh, uh, qualified Agriculture Scientist Recruitment Board test in 2018, conducted by ICAR New Delhi. He has a uh, uh, number of projects from SERB, Department of Science and Technology. He is presently members of many research bodies like uh, American Society of Plant Biology, Plant Society, Proteomics Society of India, International Plant Proteomics Organization, member of Board of Association of uh, Polar Early Career Scientists, uh, member of Society for uh, Experimental Biology. He is editorial board member of Journal of Plant Sciences, International Journal of Biochemistry and Physiology, Peer J in Journal of Biological Sciences, Food Microbiology, Food Chemistry. Uh, with this uh, uh, introduction, I would like to request uh, uh, Dr. Prashant to give his presentation. Over to Dr. Prashant. Dr. Prashant. Can you share the screen, Dr. Prashant? Yes. Or Dr. Prashant. Dr. Prashant, you can start your presentation. Good. Firstly, good morning, uh, one and all. And uh, today, uh, and thank you very much, Dr. Khan, for giving me uh, a uh, uh, detailed introduction about me. Uh, and thank you very much for giving an opportunity to deliver a talk in this prestigious event. So. Today, I'm going to discuss uh, one of my work that Sir, there is some issue with you. Your uh, screen has stopped the sharing. Oh, maybe due to a network connection has lost. Wait a minute. Now it's okay. Yeah, it is coming again. Okay. So uh, the topic today is the phenotypic characterization of DDM1. This DDM1 stands for deficient in DNA methylation. 
so uh, we all know this the methylation is responsible for si gene silencing okay so we have uh, created a mutation of this ddm1 gene which is responsible for the methylation okay so this ddm1 stands for deficient in dna methylation so it's mutant and uh, I, we have taken the white type uh, that is m82 of solanum lycopersicum that is tomato and its characterization under the heat stress okay so a uh, little bit I, I would like to go for oh my god so as we all know epigenetics regulate the gene expression without altering the dna sequences this is very important thing because most of the genetic engineering manipulation that we do it alters the gene sequence okay but here the epigenetic changes they do not alter the gene sequences the gene sequence remains same but they do some methylation or some other events like uh, 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 prenylation and uh, phosphorylation and they silence the gene so epigenetics is very important aspect so they alter the DNA sequences and offers plant response to its environment. Whatever the environment, they offer some protection against the environmental condition. Okay. Hence, the regulators of epigenetic response for its source of viability. Okay. This, uh, uh, the methylation process is mediated by, I am skipping this slide, the uh, whole gene silencing process is mediated by why this led actually yes so the, uh, there are three kinds of methylation uh, which is regulate uh, regulated by the different uh, protein coding genes so one is uh, known as the uh, symmetric methylation another one is known as asymmetric methylation and the third one which is ex uh, exclusively found in case of plant but now it, it is also repeated in some fungi and bacterial species so this is known as the RNA directed DNA methylation. Okay, the first one is the symmetric methylation. It is controlled by the cytosine methyl transferases and MET1 methyl transferase T1 and the chromosome methyl transferase CMT3. The second one is the asymmetric methylation that is regulated by the chromomethyl transferases and domain rearrangement methyl transfer that is DRM genes. And the third one is I have already discussed that is RNA directed DNA methylation. This kind of methylation is brought up by some non coding RNA, means the RNA is somehow regulating the expression of a particular gene. Okay, so uh, we have focused on these two that is asymmetric methyl transferases as RNA as well as this RNA directed dna methyl transferases so i am today i am going this put to discuss this only the rna directed dna methylation uh, event and uh, this rna directed dna methylation process is usually regulated by uh, a set of gene which are uh, uh, known to regulate uh, the formation of non these non coding rna and these non coding rna regulate the gene expression among which today I am going to discuss only uh, uh, one gene that is DDM1A. So this DDM1 uh, that is deficient uh, in DNA methylation gene. A. This gene have the two copy in tomato. This gene is well explored in case of Arabidopsis, but uh, the report is from the plants is not available till now this uh, DNA methylation gene which is uh, in in more in the formation of uh, small non coding RNA. am i audible any problem am i audible okay so uh, this yes okay thank you very much for confirming so this whole process involves the generation of ddm1 mutant okay and their genotyping and their seedling survival under the short term exposure to histogity stress in order to evaluate whether the mutant that I have got it is providing heat stress or not. Because uh, uh, heat stress is causing large scale uh, uh, reduced yield of tomato plant. Okay, and besides the secondary effects, also the pathogen attacks and other things. And the third is the phenotypic uh, phenotypic characterization of these generated mutants. 
uh, under the greenhouse condition as well as in the field condition so that we can compare the uh, what is the difference between the uh, growth if we are going in the greenhouse as well as in the when we are going in the field condition and the, the most important thing is, is the long term exposure of the heat stress okay so we we just uh, given i have given a long term heat, heat exposure because the tomato yield reduced dramatically in the uh, summer season and in india uh, we get uh, the, these tomato at very, very higher uh, prices okay so for doing uh, for generation of this gdm mutant we designed the three guide rna uh, for for each uh, copy of this DDM1 gene, that is DDM1A and DDM1B, so we generated uh, the three guide RNA, which are targeted to the exonic region of these two genes. Okay, and we use this uh, PRCS35 uh, uh, as a gene PRC uh, vector for cloning these three guide RNA, and we then uh, cloned in the agrobacterium and then transfer uh, to the uh, tomato cotyledon that is MAT2 we have selected. And after the transformation, we selected the positive uh, mutants, okay? Then uh, the positive mutants were, uh, when we uh, isolated the DNA from these mutant population, as well as from the wild type that is MAT2, and uh, uh, did the uh, PCR of the respective gene, or that is DDM1A and DDM1B from MAT2, as well as the DDM1 mutant that we got after the plant tissue culture. So we found that in, the, in DDM1A, the second exon having 131 base pair deletion because of the case 9 activity. While the M82, it's uh, having the uh, gene which is uh, having size size around 1239 kb, so it is remain the uh, 1.239 kb, which is remain the same. While the in mutant, it is uh, but the side is reduced around 131 base pair. So that confirms that the case 9 has worked, and we got the positive mutant. And the second that is DDM1B, uh, this DDM1B having the equal size of uh, from the M82, but this is uh, sensitive to, uh, the M82 is sensitive to uh, digestion with MLUC1, while the in mutant it is resistant because the restriction site is cut by the case 9. The case 9 says has been removed. Okay, so single base pair deletion here we found. So one base pair uh, got deleted from the fourth exon in DDM1B. So uh, these are the plants. Uh, sorry for background noise. So these are the plants that are generated through the uh, CRISPR Cas9 in their T2 generation. So we found that. Uh, the wild type that is M82 having a very luxuriant growth, while the mutant they have very stunted growth. So their growth is inhibited. Also, uh, we found that uh, these the, the leaf morphology is different. That is another story. So here are the, uh, they are the plant which is uh, which is shown in the figure in the uh, control environment and uh, and after that in the greenhouse. So here you can see the, the DDM1 mutants, they have the stunted growth. And we also found the flowering is delayed. So we are working as, on this aspect why this flowering is uh, delayed and we are getting flowers late. So there might be this methylation event uh, that is the RNA directed DNA methylation is uh, suppressed somehow. The vegetative growth is already suppressed, so it could be possible the and the flowering uh, reproductive growth is coming later. So after this, uh, we decided to go for uh, this uh, uh, heat stress phenotype, whether uh, that, uh, the, these mutants that we have generated, uh, it is providing tolerance toward the heat stress or not. So we have just uh, preliminary, we did the, with the seedlings. So we, we, we have sown the seeds and after uh, seven days of sowing, we treat at the, you know, here the protocol is written. So we treat with the heat state at 45 degrees centigrade for continuous four hours. So here you can see the control that is uh, non-state. They are uh, both the mutants uh, almost look, uh, looks uh, mutant as well as wild type looks similar. But after treatment with heat stress, you can see 
that the M82 here, uh, this is the M82, and this is the DDM1A, and this is the DDM1B. You can see the M82, all of high biological liquids, M82 is not able to survive under the uh, short term exposure to heat stress. Okay, and, and while the DDM1A and DDM1B mutants, they are able to uh, grow luxuriantly, not luxuriantly, but uh, their survival rate is more than 50% compared to uh, the wild type M82. Here you can see uh, in the bar chart. Then we compare uh, on, uh, these plants under the heat distress in the greenhouse as well as in field condition. So here I am showing the greenhouse data only because of the field uh, data, I will have to uh, work on it. So here you can see, uh, we have uh, selected a large number of phenotypic uh, changes that Dr. Prashant, you lost your I mean, presentation. Dr. Prashant. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sorry, sir. So, uh, yeah, uh, after uh, the uh, uh, seedling experiment, we uh, grow these plants that are generated mutant as well as wild type in field condition as well as in greenhouse. Uh, here I am showing the only greenhouse data. The field work data is somehow complicated, so I will have to do some statics work and then I will show that one. So, in the greenhouse, we found that uh, I'm at T2 is uh, uh, sensitive towards the heat stress while these ddm1 and ddm1b they are tolerant towards the heat stress so we have selected a large number of uh, parameters as shown here so uh, among which are the flowering phenotype pollen viability pollen germination seed setting that we all have taken in consideration so flowering phenotype, uh, here I'm just showing flower, but we have selected a large number of uh, parameters for flowering, it means uh, how many, uh, 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 there, there is style elongation, and uh, how many petals are there, how many uh, uh, tepals are there, okay? And so here you can see the M82, the flowers are short lived while in DDM1A and DDM1B, they are, uh, they are uh, long lived and they are setting the fruits while in m82 there is a drastic reduction in the uh, uh, flower to fruit set ratio okay so uh, we have counted how many flowers are there okay and then we have counted how many flowers are converting into fruit okay so we found that uh, this ddm1a is ddm1b uh, they are uh, resistance toward the heat stress while m82 that is the control is it is having uh, reduced uh, fruit setting ratio so uh, then we tried to find out what is the reason behind it so one one reason we found that this is because of short-lived flower the second we have got to the pollen viability test whether the pollen uh, able to fertilize uh, uh, they are viable or not so we have selected this m 2 and DDM1 and we, here you can see clearly in the picture the DDM1A and DDM1B having a large number of viable pollen in compared to m 2 Similarly, if there is a large number of uh, viable pollen, then a large number of germination also, meaning the pollen tube is germination through the pollen. And uh, if there is a large number of pollen and large number of uh, germination of pollen tubes, so we have got a large number of fruit set in case of DDM1A and DDM1B. Here you can see, so the seeds that we have collected from the m 2 as well as the DDM1A and DDM1B, here you can see the DDM1B and DDM1A having large number of seeds compared to m 2 but we found one difference that in DDM1B, the seed size is a little. 
okay so here uh, in the figure uh, the uh, the greenhouse experiment that we did here shown so we have planted the plant in the two uh, one two three rows so by uh, taking at least five to uh, six biological replicates then we compare the uh, ddm1 population under the long term exposure source to higher fruit set and seeds Settings. So, field setting I have already shown. So, here you can see on that. Sorry. Sorry, because of. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. So, here you can see the control uh, MAT2 and DDM1 A and DDM B in the control environment. Uh, means we have uh, uh, placed these plantation system in two different greenhouses having the same uh, setting of humidity and uh, temperature. No, not temperature, humidity and soil fertility and other things, everything was same except the temperature. So this is the fruits that we have uh, collected from the control environment greenhouse. And the second one here, you can see the heat stress environment. So here you can see uh, the control that is M82 in the heat stress, they have uh, a very little seed and also the pulp of the fruit is reduced here you can see a large number of a large amount of pulp is there and the also seeds here the pulp is also reduced but we found a little bit more thickness in the pericarp of the fruit so that is uh, another thing we are investigating on that so here in the heat stress the m82 having very reduced amount of pulp as well as the seed while the ddm1b it's it's uh, uh, reproduce, um, the productivity is uh, in terms of uh, the fruit pulp is almost equivalent to the the control. So we found that DDM one A is having a large number of fruit setting ratio compared to M eighty two as well as DDM one B. Here you can see the, in the DDM one B also the seed count is very. Uh, uh, more, but the seeds size is very small, and also they have the reduced pulp of the fruit. So we found that DDM one A having the higher fruit setting condition under the heat stress. Okay. So then, after we uh, selected uh, some marker gene, I am showing here the marker gene only the HSP seventeen point six. So we found that its expression under the uh, in DDM1A uh, is uh, increased. Uh, we have selected different uh, conditions like uh, high salt condition, desiccation. So the air bar, the bars here shown here, like uh, the yellow color is heat stress, eight hours, and uh, uh, the blue one, uh, sky blue color is two hours. So here you can see uh, uh, on uh, short term exposure to heat stress, the DDM1A gene and the uh, long-term exposure ddm1b gene is, is uh, sorry hsp 17.6 gene expression is increased okay so this hsp 17.6 we are also working on that so hsp 17.6 is well known to provide uh, uh, heat stress tolerance so in conclusion uh, uh, that, that is my last slide in conclusion that the ddm1 mutants are better adapted to heat stress compared to the wild type that is m82 and could be exploited as heat stress tolerance cultivar since this uh, ddm1 mutant they are crispr edited population so we can uh, use uh, them for growing or uh, release to the farmers for cultivation and uh, last slide that is thank you very much and uh, sir uh, i have finished my talk Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Prashant, uh, for your beautiful presentation and showing how the plants are tolerating the stress and how the uh, improved varieties can be developed uh, from your talk. So I request now Dr. Mahesh, Dr. Mahesh to uh, start sharing his screen. You can switch on the camera. Dr. Prashant? Okay, sir. Dr. 
डॉक्टर महेश डॉक्टर महेश प्लीज रेस्पॉन्ड Uh, your co-host dr mahesh actually you can unmute yourself right sir but, yeah yeah i did you can start sharing the screen am i visible ah uh, yeah you are visible uh, your screen is it the, is this your screen presentation screen uh not really uh, just a minute just a minute yes sir is it there now to start you sharing screen sir actually I started. Uh, uh, I'm having some problem with the net. Right now, I'm uh, working on my mobile because of the server issue. You can start your video at least. I will start the introduction of yours. Uh, no, sir. Just wait. Uh, I'll share my. So here I am getting few options like OneDrive, Google Drive, Box, Photo, Document, something like that. So. what should i do share whiteboard pardon share whiteboard uh, you are going to actually what i do uh, share come to know, uh, what is going on when you start your video and you share the screen you will come to know what is the concept going on uh, right sir but what happening here is uh, when i opt for uh, share screen then there are different options so what should i uh, share uh nothing is visible here because this is the first time i am uh, using this particular platform it is good with uh, uh, gmit but uh, anyways share document where is your presentation it is in documents or where it is in the mobile it is in uh, there in wps it is in wps mobile okay so if it is for document it is not visible to me at least audio video images document no reason matches one time it band hote hai Screen. Start now. Can you do it again?
डॉक्टर महेश डॉक्टर महेश आर यू देर इफ यू सेंड व्हाट्सएप आई विल शेयर योर प्रेजेंटेशन इफ दैट इज अ केस Dr. Mahesh, can I share your uh, presentation? You have sent what you have sent to me. Yes, sure, sir. Sure. Please. Okay. Please okay. I'll, I'll share your uh, presentation. What you have sent to me. Yeah, now you can start your presentation. Is it visible to you? It it is visible to me, but I guess uh, this is my uh, CV. Not this one. Yeah. Magnetic magnetic uh, bacteria and their applications in nanobiotechnology. This one is not visible on the screen. No. Yeah. Now I am. What it is visible is uh, achievements and awards. Award awards are not right. Something like that. One second. Okay, let me introduce you, and then I'll uh, stop this uh, thing, and then I'll uh, go back. So okay. he is Dr. Mahesh <laughs> Chawdar, scientist uh, from National Center for Microbial Resource (NCMR), National Center Center for Cell Science (NCCS) Pune. Uh, he is PhD in microbiology from Shivaji University, Kolhapur. His uh, topic of PhD was studies on magnetotactic bacteria from Lonar Lake, a hypervelocity meteorite impact uh, Carter Lake. His research area is magnetotactic bacteria, and uh, he worked on bio bioluminescent bacteria. microbial ecology and taxonomy agriculture microbiology uh, he mentored more than 30 master students for uh, for uh, dissertation in their masters degree from different colleges and universities across india he is uh, he was scientist b till uh, since 2011 and uh, he is curator in uh, uh, ncmr and he is uh, curator general deposit alpha epsilon proteobacteria and bacteriotis he is member for various societies like uh, international society for salt lake research california and uh, he is a uh, uh, life member for association of microbiologists india and he is life member for uh, microbial society of india with this few words of introduction i would like to share his presentation over here
are you able to see now dr mahesh yes sir and now you can start i will be moving the slides this is his first slide and uh, can i move for next uh, you have to uh, presentation mode you have to give it on presentation mode presentation mode i am not able to see here So just like earlier, uh, uh, control F five or something like that. Okay. Right. Now uh, be on first slide. Be on first slide, please. Yeah. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Mahesh. Uh, from ncmr national center for microbial resource and uh, i am a part of nccs that is national center for cell sciences pune india and we are a premier research institute in india as well as uh, i am proud to say that uh, ncmr is the one of the biggest culture collections microbial culture collections in the world right and today i am we want to talk on uh, magnetotactic bacteria and their applications and uh, to start with i will uh, limit my talk on the applications because that is not uh, at practical level rightly but still it is required that if there is someone from biotechnology background or uh, particularly microbiology background uh, in that case it is definitely necessary to start this particular work in india why i have to say this this it will be on next slide so next slide yeah some history and uh, this is very important for our research field in particular because if you see the slide then these organisms were first record, uh, reported by uh, belleni in 1963 and published in his thesis or his uh, uh, report of his university what for whatsoever reason he can't publish it in a journal and he lost the credit why i'm saying this is because what he observed that there are some organisms that sensitize themselves to magnetic poles but he can't publish Yeah, he, he didn't publish whatsoever it is. Then comes the Robert Blackmore, the father of this field. In 1975, he was just a B.Sc. student or a graduate student. He published his first report of magnetotactic bacteria in the field of uh, as a first report of these organisms, and he is called as father. So now thing is. after 12 years he found the same thing named them as magnetic bacteria and got the credit so now the point is one should have published his data in a good journal at least in a journal not in his thesis or dissertation next please sir this is robert blackmore he was not searching for magnetic bacteria he was studying the simple technique motility of bacteria but he found something that was unusual and this is based of science so if you go for it you can get it okay so my point is when you get something new go for it and that was that is a better thing now magnetotactic bacteria so what are magnetotactic bacteria they are prokaryotes no doubt bacteria always prokaryotes but they are aquatic means they live in aquatic environment and use their capacity to migrate up or down in sediments as per their requirement using the geomagnetic field now here is the case is 
they are predominantly present in oxic anoxic zone because mainly they are actually uh, anoxic or microaerophilic so they move in a oxic anoxic zone now here is concept i will clear you later uh, third is magnetic bacteria is a different thing means they are not a clear taxonomic bacterial group they are everywhere in all phylums all uh, domains but they are magnetic now about their shapes in particular in bacteria uh, microbiology or uh, biotechnology they are of different shapes okay now the concept here is whether they are ns or ss what is ns north seeking or south, south seeking here my point is if you consider a globe there is north upside there is north pole south downside south pole and then there is equator in north pole what they do is they try to go towards north predominantly predominantly north seeking in south pole they are predominantly south seeking what does it mean their particles which are responsible for their magnetism they are specifically or dominantly towards that pole not necessarily they are to continuously uh, go towards north that means what i mean to say is if they are in india they start swimming today they will reach somewhere in russia in few years that is not the case what is the case is they are predominantly in that pole means what i mean to say here is if there is a magnet you consider this bacteria as a magnet a magnet is having two poles north and south what i mean to say here is if there is a anoxic bacteria or microaerophilic in both cases when there is adverse condition then that will try to go inside the mud or inside the sediment so what will it do it will just changes magnetic moment magnetic moment means it will just change its direction just sim as simple as if you want to go in the water while swimming will change our head size right head side just like that if you want to go down go down if you want to go up go up so these organisms use their magnetic domain accordingly means in south pole their magnetic domain is strongly at so south in north pole their magnetic domain is strong at north side okay so here question comes what will happens at the equator so on the equator there is definitely both organisms or both type of organism will be present and they will use the condition accordingly next slide sir sir next slide ha huh. so what makes these organisms magnetotactic and here is our point nanobiotechnology these are magnetic particles which are responsible for the mag magnetic moment of these organisms they are the signature feature of these organisms particularly because they are magnetic second thing they are of different types which organism produces which type of magnet is not really important but there are different types they are they may be magnetite gregite or percolite whatever it is but they produce some ion particles which are called as magnetites and different things next slide please okay now at the point of our applications of these organisms as i told i will limit my thing on this particular part that is their application as you can see if you see the tm image transmission electron microscope tm image of a particular bacteria that produces a magnetic chain these are the small particles which are called as magnetosomes which have a very important role 
in geocycling by geocycling of iron metal in the system that is biomineralization then they have specific characters like as i said if you on this slide only if i want to talk about applications of these organisms the very peculiar character of this magnetism is a, it is a nanoparticle now everyone is aware about what are nanoparticles right now if we talk about this application of these organisms then we can bifurcate the applications in two things but before that i would like to come for a simple thing why mtb in nano nanotechnology or nanobiotechnology what is their importance to start with what are their applications to start with their applications are in 1984 the, in america in allen hills they found a meteorite of which origin was confirmed that it is from mars then they analyzed that particular meteorite and found that there is a crystal or what you can as uh there is a bacterial shape which they have identified and found that there are some crystals there in that bacterial form which are exactly similar to magnetic bacteria which are similar which are present on earth in this time so what they claim that if this is the case then life may be came from outside therefore they the meteorite was claimed as alh allen hills 84 1984 therefore 84 and 001 because that was the first meteorite right so there is something interesting in this field because they are somewhere related to extraterrestrial life okay now coming to today's things for their application what are past or what are future that will be different thing but what we can do today or tomorrow now the case is if you are interested in nanotechnology what will one person will do it will they will synthesize mm -hmm. nanoparticles there are some problems with chemically or physically synthesized nanoparticles the particular thing is it will be require, it will require high machineries or high uh, pressure or high uh, different ph or many things now the case is if you synthesize anything from this uh, technique the situation will be if you synthesize a nanoparticle that if you consider 100 particles then there is some percentage that will not be have a regular crystal structure second thing their chemical composition third thing their uh, uniform shape coming to biological system biologically synthesized um, uh, nanoparticles here we can differentiate the applications in two parts the first part is a cell synthesizing nanoparticles so what happens is sir be on uh, earlier side only what happens is if you consider cell as a factory then that cell will continuously synthesize nanoparticles which will be of uniform size because that is biological controlled uniform chemical structure and uniform shape say for example i am using magnetospirillum then there will be a bullet shape magnetic uh, nanoparticle and it will be continuously con uh, produced of a same size because it is it is biologically controlled second thing first part so what we have to do is grow the cells take the particles now where to use this particles i am shorting it where to use this particle wherever you require 
nanoparticles, you can use them. Because you consider, if you consider the structure, then they have a magnetic particle enveloped with a magnetic coating. So what happens is, or covering, what happens is, if you consider other magnetic particles or other nanoparticles, you are using for a particular thing for, uh, say for example, uh, coating or uh, uh, bioactivity or enzymes, antibodies or something. So in that case, it is definitely uh, difficult to separate them. But in this case, even if you use an enzyme and coat it on this my organism, sorry, uh, nanoparticles, so it will be easy just to use a magnet outside the fermenter. You can easily separate them because they are magnetic particles, right? So this is the application and very seriously, who are interested in nanotechnology can use these particles for anything, enzyme embolization, antibody embolization, target specific drug discovery, MRI scanning, everywhere you can use this because they are biologically synthesized, okay? So this is for my application part, sir, next. So how to detect these organisms from environmental samples? So for microbiologists, it is very simple for biotechnologists, but for others in microbiology or biotechnology, what we do is we observe bacterial mortality by hanging drop technique. So what modification we do here is we use a south pole somewhere around uh, five to 10 centimeters near the drop and see whether the organisms are responding to the magnet. So what response here is, whether they're coming toward the magnet and if you change the pole, whether they are going inside. Going inside is a different thing for microbiology. Once the organism comes to the edge of that particular drop, it will never grow inside. So in this case, if they're magnetic, if you pull the, change the pole, they will go inside. So this is basic phenomenon but for a microbiologist, for a biotechnologist, for even other scientific works, workers, observing motility is a bit challenging task, but we can do that, right? So in first case what, okay, so what we have to do is, we have to observe the motility and see whether they are giving any magnetic response, okay? So this is the first step, how you can detect a magnetic organism, not only bacteria, magnetic organism, in a particular system, okay, in a particular ecological system. So next. Now what you have to do is, when you see that the sample contains magnetic organisms, then, or magnetic bacteria, then you have to enrich them. In normal cases, there are different types of media which are used for enrichment of, what is enrichment? Selection of the intestinal organisms and on the other hand, depletion, depletion of other organisms. Here in this case, if I'm interested in MTB, magnetic bacteria, then I have to select them. In normal cases, there are selective media, we can easily select them. Here there is, as I said earlier, they're not a specific group, they're diverse organisms. So here what we do is, we use a basic selection method that you just separate them. After separation, what we do, if you see the magnet here, then there is sediment, there is water sediment interface and water. As I told earlier, the organisms are present at mud water interface. Mud water interface. So what happens is, if they are present here and I put a The, organis the organisms will gather here, okay? So definitely MTB will gather here, magnetic bacteria or MTB, I'll call you MTB here after. MTB will gather at this particular point where the magnet is placed. Then I will take a sample here, yeah, right? But they're not, all are not MTB. There is some, there are some organisms which are already present and they will not move anywhere. So we have to separate them. Next slide, sir. Next slide, sir. So for that separation, in normal cases, isolation and separation, rather, 
detection and separation are on a single plate here we, there are two steps so what we do is the first thing when i scoop out the sample or uh, pipette out the sample then if you see this particular image then there is magnetically collected sample that is the first sample from that magnet side then there is cotton plug and then there is chemically defined medium which is required for it so what happens is everyone knows who keep uh, microorganisms cannot pass a cotton now the thing is if you carry out this capillary extract method placed by blackmore if this particular method if you carry out then it is a am audible it is a pasture pipette you are audible you are audible yeah it is a pasture pipette it is this capillary side and this is pipette side and this is opening so if i prepare this particular thing then i'll put a magnet here what will happen is there will be formation of magnetic field and do using that magnet particular magnetic field in search of food the organisms present in magnetically collected sample will pass through this cotton plug and come to chemical defined medium then after 40 to 45 minutes what i will do is i'll just break this capillary that narrow side and put the sample in another growth media next slide please sir next slide yeah so what happen here is when i get that particular sample from that capillary extract method crt i'll first inoculate that in a uh, broth for their cultivation and to just to confirm that they are really magnet tactic one has to continue the same method the capillary extract method for 3 to 4 five, five times as per the requirement once you confirm that ki they are magnet tactic then you can again go for uh, hanging drop technique using the magnet you see whether they are responding whether the response is more than earlier then if you confirm that ki they are mtb then you can go for their cultivation but firstly in firstly in liquid medium then on solid medium and finally for their preservation using different methods you can preserve them as a slant at 4 degree you can preserve them as a glycerol stock at uh, minus 80 you can preserve them at minus 196 in liquid nitrogen whatever possible to you you have to just to maintain the culture next slide sir yeah so when you preserve the culture what you have to do is you have to confirm the culture is magnet tactic there are different ways as i said microscopic observation grow the culture again and uh, see whether it is responding to magnet it is a bit problematic but uh, still you can do that the second level option is uh, cultivate the organism on iron containing plates as the organism is magnetic it will require iron and uh, definitely uh, it will accumulate more iron than the normal organisms like bacillus e coli or whatever it is so if you estimate their uh, intracellular iron content that is grow in a media with iron and uh, disturb the cells extract the intracellular content and uh, check the iron ability so what we found is there is 10 to 12% increase in uh, iron availability rather the iron uh, content of the cell than the normal like bacillus or e coli 
so uh, it is a simple method but it requires as if it is possible then you can use a control organism and estimate the intracellular content that will be a better thing because uh, there the highest requirement is tm transmission electron microscopy which is not available everywhere uh, if it is available then it is available for uh, uh, physical things or uh, majorly uh, material science but in case of biology there are very few labs which work on biological material for tm so it is a better option next so as i said uh, hanging drop it is a bit uh, tricky thing that uh, one has to understand whether the organism coming towards the edge it is difficult so in that case because of the other very 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 tiny organisms uh, it is difficult to say that whether they are responding to the magnetic field second thing uh, as i said ion content analysis it is a bit uh, not definitely too big but uh, as is a definitely not available everywhere and second thirdly definitely team is not available everywhere right so uh, what we did is we use a simple technique uh, considering their uh, uh, physiology uh, in particular their uh, magnetic response and developed a simple te technique go for the next slide sir so what we did is uh, the first slide uh, this is a chemical defined medium uh, where we put uh, magnets as south pole north pole and uh, there is a, a regular state inoculation uh, here there is first is a sample second is magnetic control uh, second is uh, non magnetic control and third is magnetic control first is magnetic control that is sample if it responds to magnet or magnetic field it will go somewhere second as it is a non magnetic it will not go anywhere it should be on the straight line and third is non magnetic it should be on the uh, line of inoculation because there is no magnetic field there will be some sort of uh, uh, migration because uh, there is no magnetic field right next sir next yeah so this is actual practice how we did uh, or how, how one should do there is a sample sample is as i said mud sediment uh, sediment water uh, interface okay and the inoculation using the magnet next sir so when you carry out the actual capillary extract so there are different uh, tubes one is uh, magnetic control non magnetic control and capillary uh, sediments so what happens is when you carry out the capillary extract in first two controls there is nothing crt control sediment control whatever it is there is no, no growth is there when you uh, uh, media control without sample or media control without magnet there is no growth and there after this when you carry out the particular thing there you can there is a visible growth so what happens is if they are magnetic if they are responding to magnetic field they will cross that cotton plug and come inside the media in search of food next so this is confirmation of magnetic axis as i said uh, if you see there control 1 control 2 control 3 the ion content is very less and these are the other organisms which are magnetic and their ion control for example uh, the highest is uh, mtb2 which is showing almost 12% more ion content in the cells which indirectly proves that these organisms are accumulating ion whether they are accumulating ion just for the sake or in form of magnetism we have to confirm we confirmed it later but we have to confirm that and that is a simple thing 
I don't have that video here, but I can say if you have such such culture, then just follow a regular uh, stain description uh, protocol. Just for example, for DNA extraction, then verify it and just have a simple magnet. You can see uh, a beautiful thing of magnetosomes responding visible, visible to eye, responding to the magnetic field. Next. So as I said, the semi agar method, the first thing is the non-magnetic control. Where there are two magnets, here it's a, it is a pictorial, there are two magnets, but it remained on the straight line of inoculation. Second is the sample in the magnetic field where there are many cells migrated towards south pole and rested there developing a colony. So you can easily say that these are magnetic. They are responding to the magnet. And third plate is of the same sample where there is no magnetic field. But as I said, they will try to migrate somewhere because there is geomagnetic field. This is my invention and that led many people working in this particular field. right? So my intention is just want to grow this field in India because uh, there are very few labs or rather there are no labs working in India except uh, NCMR. So I welcome anyone who want to work in this particular field. Next. This is the same picture of actual culture. This is north seeking uh, uh, magnetic bacteria. So why, why I'm talking about north is when you talk about north pole of uh, our planet, then magnetically it is south. Therefore, the magnetic compass attracts as a north pole. Therefore, we call it as a north pole. But otherwise, they are north seeking. And I guess uh, here I will like to end my presentation. And uh, with uh, permission of the organizer, the session is now open for discussion. Yeah, it is uh, very interesting uh, to know, Dr. Mahesh, so many things in the uh, new kind of trends that is magnetotactic bacteria. Uh, as the time has arrived for lunch session, so uh, we, we beg pardon, uh, just we feel very thankful for uh, your beautiful presentation and very new eye-opening uh, concept, what you have told magnetotactic bacteria and how many hurdles you have faced to make this uh, presentation look so beautiful. So in a short and sweet crisp, you have told so much uh, thing. So thank you very much, Dr. Mahesh, for your beautiful presentation. Now, uh, before ending the session, I would request uh, Professor uh, Aruna Ma'am to quickly summarize today's sessions and then we can end the, uh, the conference. Over to Aruna Ma'am. Aruna Ma'am. Aruna ma'am. Yes, you are visible ma'am. You can start your uh, today's yes, good uh, afternoon, sir. briefings. Good afternoon everybody. And as it's the second day of our international conference, we had uh, four technical sessions. And totally, we had six uh, lectures. And uh, we have started uh, the talk with Dr. Manoj Kumar, sir. And uh, his uh, talk was related to plant microorganisms interactions, where he had uh, clearly explained about plant uh, microbe interaction and microorganism signaling, and uh, also discussed about technological microbiology and its applications with reference to specific areas like agricultural microbiology, medical microbiology, chemical and uh, fuel microbiology, environmental microbiology. And uh, Sir has also focused a few of the pictures where uh, we had understood about diversity of root system in prairies and also about root morphology of hippopay. 
and we are very much grateful to you, sir, and the whole of the faculty of Department of Botany, Telangana University. I would like to thank you very much, sir. Next, we had a talk by Professor Abdul Tohel, and he's from Bangladesh. The title of the talk was really interesting. It was all about applications of plant bioreactor system for uh, industrial scale production of valuable plant cells. And uh, through his uh, talk, we have learned that around 44% uh, of the new medical on natural products and 120 plant derived uh, compounds were used in medicine. And uh, he also discussed about natural cultivation of valuable medicinal plants. And uh, he also, oh, what is it, uh, focused on the problems of plant-based uh, medicine production and how to overcome these problems was clearly uh, explained. And his area of uh, problem identified in uh, botanical characterization, environmental pollution, crop uh, protection, and processing pollution, and also about in vitro culture for production of active compounds where he clearly dealt about cell cultures and organ cultures and uh, how much important uh, these plants uh, play a role in production of uh, medicine, particularly in constraint of health, human health and economy. So we are very much thankful to you, sir. It was a wonderful pre presentation and uh, we would like to express our uh, deep sense of gratitude to you, sir, all over from Bangladesh. Thank you, sir. And next, we had a talk by Dr. Dolapalli Pavan, and uh, his talk also was a little bit uh, different. It was all about patient-specific interactions, and he discussed about uh, disease-modifying uh, genes. So we express our sincere thanks to Pavan, sir. Next, we had a talk by Dr. China Naik, and uh, his talk was all about uh, the principles, objectives, and importance of medicinal plants. And uh, he also made us understand about the scope, importance, and uh, he, uh, what is it, has shown for a list of endangered uh, plants and threatened plants in India, uh, which are, uh, for example, like Gloriosa, Superba, Costa Speciosa, and Saraka, and Dendrobium. And uh, he also dealt uh, with the significance of some important plants where around 9,000 uh, native plants have been established and recorded uh, with curative properties and about 1,500 species were known for uh, their aroma and flavor. And uh, also focused on the significance of uh, medicinal plants exclusively like uh, ashwagandha, aloe vera, chandra charolo, henna and kalamek. So we are very much grateful to you, sir. And thank you for being with us today. And we had a talk by Dr. Prashant Kumar Singh, and uh, his talk also was a little bit uh, different. So he had uh, shared his experiences about uh, his uh, lab, and whole of his research work was related to tomato plant. And next, so we are thankful to you, sir. We had a talk uh, by Dr. Mahesh Chavadar. And this talk was also really interesting and impressive. And we are very much thankful to you, sir. And uh, he had uh, dealt about uh, magnetotactic bacteria, magnetosomes, and magnetotaxis. And uh, sir has also focused on uh, methodology where he made us understand, and all the students uh, might have uh, taken a note how you could uh, detect for magnetotactic bacteria and how could you could isolate magnetotactic bacteria and how can we cultivate and how can we confirm about magnetotaxis. So these are uh, the lectures delivered by all the resource persons today. And uh, we feel that uh, we are proud to have eminent scientists in the department of Telangana University. We are very much thankful to you, sir. And the same way, I would like to acknowledge due thanks to all the scientists, faculty, research scholars, and students who were with us for these two days and uh, made this uh, international conference successful. 
And uh, last and not least, I would like to thank Dr. Alim Khan, sir, who is head department of Botany. And he has taken initiation in conducting, organizing this two days uh, international conference. And with these few words, I would like to thank and thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your uh, overall briefing of the two day sessions. Uh, uh, with this, uh, as it is a lunch time, people are very hungry. I think it is one o'clock already. So overall, we sum up the two days national con international conference. We could cover almost all the parts of India, speakers from almost all parts of India and uh, participants also from uh, various states of the country. And uh, we have got uh, the international scientists also and uh, people from Australia, New Zealand, uh, then China and Bangladesh. So all these people have given, shared their own knowledge. And uh, I hope that this conference has benefited a number of people who are participating since two days. Uh, so with this uh, few kind words, I would like to declare the conference as end. And uh, please for certificates, you send us the email, we'll marking the attendance and shortly we are going to make the automated the certificate system so that you can receive your certificates uh, uh, to your mail at the earliest so kindly all the participants please uh, send email uh, email id has been already shared in the morning so please use that email id and uh, send us the, your details so that we can uh, uh, complete the uh, participation participation certificates get in time thank you i uh, would like to express my deep sense of gratitude towards our uh, Public relation officer, Dr. Triveni, uh, who uh, was already expected to join us, but she couldn't join. And also uh, Dr. Naveen Kumar, who is programmer, computer programmer, who helped us to publicize our uh, two days international conference. And we would like to e express our uh, thanks to all the faculty members in the department. Uh, Professor Aruna ma'am, Professor Vidyavardini ma'am, and uh, Dr. Jalandhar, Dr. Srinivas and uh, all the cast and crew of this uh, conference. Thank you very much. And uh, we expect the same kind of support in uh, the coming days. So hereby we end our uh, conference. Thank you everybody.